Good morning, all. Um, I want to welcome you to the Sunday, December 20th, 2020, um, second day of the ACIP meeting. Um, this is uh, uh, our meeting to discuss um, <clears throat> phase one, uh, 1B and 1C um, allocation. So um, I will begin by taking roll, um, and we will talk uh, take roll only from those individuals that are voting members. Um, so please, when I call your name, please indicate your institution and any conflicts you may have. And, and, I, and I will begin. Jose Romero, um, Secretary of Health, State of Arkansas, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Dr. Atmar. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Robert Atmar, uh, Professor, Section of Infectious Disease, Department of Medicine, Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, as I understand it from yesterday's discussion, I have no conflicts relative to the vote today, although I have participated in NIH-supported COVID-19 vaccine studies. Over. Thank you. That is correct. Dr. Alt. My name is Kevin Alt, and I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Kansas in Kansas City, Kansas, and I have no conflicts. Ms. Bata. Good morning, Lynn Bata, Minnesota Department of Health, and I have no conflict. Dr. Bell. Beth Bell, Clinical Professor, Department of Global Health, University of Washington, no conflict. Dr. Bernstein. Hank Bernstein, Professor of Pediatrics at Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, and I have no conflict. Dr. Fry. Good morning. This is Sharon Fry. I'm a professor of internal medicine at St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri. For today's business, I have no conflict. Thank you. Dr. Hunter. Paul Hunter, associate professor of family medicine and community health at the uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison. And for today's uh, discussions, I have no conflicts. Dr. Lee. Uh, good morning, Grace Lee, Associate Chief Medical Officer, Stanford Children's Health, Professor of Pediatrics, Stanford University School of Medicine, and I have no conflicts. Ms. McNally. Good morning, Veronica McNally, President of the Franny Strong Foundation, based in Michigan, and I have no conflicts. Dr. Paling. Good morning, Kathy Paling, Professor of Pediatrics and Epidemiology and Prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine. I have no conflicts. Dr. Sanchez. Morning, um, Pablo Sanchez, I'm Professor of Pediatrics, um, in the Division of Neonatology and Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Nationwide Children's and The Ohio State University. Thank you. Dr. Salaji. Good morning, Peter Salaji. I'm a Professor and Executive Vice Chair of the Department of Pediatrics at UCLA, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Talbot. Good morning. This is Kip Talbot, and that was not my ringtone. Um, I'm an associate professor of medicine infectious diseases at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and I have no conflict. Good morning. Good morning. And I will admit to that ringtone. Um, so um, let me welcome all the members, uh, all the voting members of the ACIP. Um, we are not going to take the ex officio representatives roll call today, nor the liaison representatives, but all the same. Thank you and welcome. Thank you for giving up your morning to be with us. Um, and um, Dr. Cohn uh, has uh, <clears throat> some uh, some announcements, and I believe we have uh, Dr. Fink and Dr. Messonnier who will give us uh, uh, some uh, words. Uh, so uh, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Dr. Cohn. <clears throat> Great. We just wanted to provide a couple of updates before we get started uh, with today's uh, meeting. Uh, the first one is going to come from Dr. Doran Fink, uh, who's our ex officio member uh, from the FDA, um, and he's going to um, update us on some uh, FDA-related guidance around doses. Thank, thank you, Dr. Cohn. So uh, I think most people have heard uh, either through the news or through uh, discussions here at 
at ACIP uh, or through uh, information provided uh, directly from FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn, uh, as well as other places on our website that uh, the Pfizer uh, COVID-19 vaccine, uh, which was authorized for use uh, based on uh, an intended uh, uh, number of doses uh, of five uh, within the multi-dose vial, uh, it, it turns out that uh, more than five doses can routinely uh, be obtained uh, from these multi-dose vials using uh, or adhering to the uh, dose preparation instructions outlined in the prescribing information and in the fact sheet uh, for uh, healthcare providers. Uh, uh, based on the, the volume that is achieved upon dilution of the, the vaccine that is provided in the vial, uh, typically uh, six doses are, are obtainable, uh, sometimes with uh, very skilled um, uh, uh, preparation, a seventh dose uh, might be obtained as well. Uh, FDA has posted uh, on its website uh, in the context of a Frequently Asked Questions uh, webpage for the Pfizer vaccine uh, advice that FDA is aware um, of this issue. We are working with Pfizer uh, to update the prescribing information and uh, uh, fact sheets for, for healthcare providers uh, to reflect what we uh, consider to be uh, uh, instructions for optimal use uh, of the vaccine to address the pandemic to use every uh, full dose that, that can be obtained uh, from uh, each vial while adhering to the instructions for, uh, for uh, dose preparation. Uh, so this will result in, in usually six doses, possibly uh, seven doses. Um, and we do want to make sure that, uh, that healthcare providers are aware that the vaccine is preservative free, and so therefore it's critical uh, that uh, any uh, product that's left in the vial that is not enough uh, to uh, to make a full dose uh, should not be used, uh, and that includes that it should not be pooled uh, with uh, vaccines from from other vials. Uh, this this should not be done. Uh, but once again, uh, in order to optimally uh, address the, the pandemic, we do want healthcare providers to be using every full dose that can be obtained uh, from each vial uh, while adhering to the instructions for, uh, for preparation. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Fink. Um, before I uh, hand it over to Dr. Messonnier to make one more announcement, I just want to remind everyone to please review the public docket. Um, this is, um, I, I think this would the comments uh, that have been sent in are incredibly informative and just demonstrate uh, the huge amount of uh, interest and uh, stake that everyone feels uh, with these vaccines. Um, and so um, it really sets up the discussion that we're going to have today. So um, I just want to remind everybody to read those COVID comments because uh, they're really important. And now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Messonnier who's going to give us a quick update on the amount of doses that we anticipate being available over the next couple of months. Um, thank you, Dr. Conan. Good morning, everybody. Um, as a starting place, I want to say that our goal remains to have enough vaccine and the ability in our vaccine program to vaccinate everybody in the United States in every corner of every one of our communities as Possible. But we are faced with the situation, at least in the short term, where we have a limited supply of vaccine available to us. What that means is that there will be difficult choices about who gets that vaccine first. And this is just one of the many difficult choices that we as a society have faced this year. The goal of ACIP is to provide guidance around vaccine prioritization. We certainly understand that that guidance will then need to be translated to a local context. 
but to provide some framing around how much vaccine we anticipate being available, I'm going to go through some numbers as described by Secretary Azar earlier this week. But I want to say again that these are projections based on current understanding of vaccine availability. We certainly hope that there might be more vaccine available, but we also understand, as、um, always with vaccines, that it's possible that there would be less vaccine. But I'm hoping that these numbers would help ACIP in the difficult discussions that it has to have today. So our current understanding is that there should be enough vaccine to vaccinate 20 million people in December, 30 million people in January, and 50 million people in February. I want to again thank ACIP for the difficult deliberations as they have thought about prioritization in anticipating this moment. Since the beginning of our discussions around COVID vaccine, and I know as always, you will think about the science framed around ethics and the need to be practical in terms of implementation. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Montero. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Messonnier.、Um, Dr. Cohn, do you have anything else? Any other instructions for the、uh, voting members? Um, no, Dr. Romero. I think、um, we can move on to the、um, first item on the agenda. Very good. So、um, we'll begin then、uh, our session <clears throat> on coronavirus disease、uh, 2019 vaccines with、uh, Dr. Bell、uh, providing an introduction. Dr. Bell, please. Thank you, Dr. Romero, and、um, welcome to the second day of our emergency meeting. Uh, next, please. As you know, today's discussion is around allocation of、uh, supplies, initial supplies of COVID-19 vaccine,、um, and this will consist of、uh, two presentations.、Um, first, by Dr. Dooling、uh, about allocation of initial supplies, and、um, second, about Dr. Oliver、uh, by Dr. Oliver. Uh, with considerations for populations included in phase one B and one C, then we will have time for discussion. We will have public comment, and there will be a vote on allocation of initial supply of COVID COVID nineteen vaccine during phase one B and phase one C. Next, please.、Um, I、uh, continue to show this slide, and I, I would like to say, especially on this topic of allocation of initial supplies. Uh, I want to、uh, especially thank all of the work group members uh, for um, wrestling with these issues, which are obviously very complex and difficult. And also, next, to also thank all the CDC participants、um, in, in、uh, for helping us think through these issues. Thank you. You can、uh, take down the slides and back to you, Dr. Romero. Thank you, Dr. Bell. <clears throat> Excuse me. So、um, uh, next, we'll have a presentation by Dr.、Uh, Kathleen Dooling on allocation of initial supplies of COVID-19 vaccine phase one B and one C.、Um, please,、uh, Dr. Dooling. So this is、uh, Dr. Khan. I did. I apologize. I forgot to make one comments earlier, which is that the.、Um, Oral public comment has been moved to 2 p.m. today. It will not occur at 3 p.m.、Um, and all of the oral public comments、uh, individuals who have been selected in the random lottery have been notified of this change. So, just wanted to make sure everybody understood the change in the agenda for today、uh, with our timing. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Dooling. Please. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Good morning. Today, I'll be presenting on phased allocation of COVID-19 vaccines on behalf of the ACIP COVID-19 workgroup. The policy question before us today is: Which groups should be offered COVID-19 vaccination in Phase One B and Phase One C? I'd like to begin by reviewing the goals of the COVID-19 vaccine program that have been guiding the ACIP COVID-19 workgroup discussions. First, ensure safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines. 
reduce transmission, morbidity, and mortality of COVID-19 disease, help minimize disruption to society and the economy, including maintaining healthcare capacity, and finally, ensure equity in vaccine allocation and distribution. Next. So anticipating that demand for COVID-19 vaccine will exceed supply for the first months of a national vaccination program, the work group has endeavored to balance the goals of prevention of morbidity and mortality, along with the preservation of societal functioning, including maintaining health care capacity. In this setting, difficult choices have to be made, and the work group has learned, listened, and debated how to achieve that balance. Members of the work group strongly support vaccination being offered to every person in the United States as soon as possible. The following presentation offers a roadmap for how we can get there together. Next slide. In efforts to achieve the goals of the program, on December 1st, ACIP recommended that residents of long-term care facilities, as well as healthcare personnel, be offered vaccination first in phase 1A. Next. I'll take a step back now and, and explain that in deliberation of those recommendations and for the remaining vaccine allocation, ACIP has held 10 public ACIP meetings and there have been 28 COVID-19 workgroup meetings. The workgroup exa has examined a broad range of evidence from scientific implementation and ethical fields. The workgroup has also considered ex external expert advice from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, who provided a timely framework for the equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccine to inform ACIP and CDC. We also took into account academic reports and allocation recommendations from other countries and organizations. And importantly, the workgroup deliberations have been informed by public input. These have come in the form of focus groups involving hundreds of people, population surveys, previous work on pandemic preparedness, and of course, ACIP public comment and federal register submissions. These inputs have informed the workgroup understanding of public values and help sh have helped shape the evolution of the proposed phased allocation. Next. Next. As mentioned, residents of long-term care facilities as well as healthcare personnel will be offered vaccination first in Phase 1A. The work group proposes that in Phase 1B, that persons 75 years and older, as well as frontline essential workers, be offered COVID-19 vaccination. And in Phase C, that all persons 65 to 74 years, as well as persons 16 to 64 with high-risk medical conditions, as well as all other essential workers not previously recommended, be offered vaccine in Phase 1C. As you can see, essential workers have been categorized uh, by the work group as either frontline or other essential workers. Next slide. The work group categorization of frontline workers was informed by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Their framework for equitable allocation of vaccine highlights uh, here, which are shown here, uh, they indicate that in the first two phases, uh, fol the following workers should be offered uh, vaccination first. First responders, teachers, and school staff, as well as childcare workers, critical workers in high-risk settings, and staff working in congregate settings. Next. Similarly, the ACIP workgroup has defined frontline essential workers as workers who are in sectors essential to the functioning of society and are at substantially higher risk of exposure to SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID. Specifically, these are first responders, firefighters and police, uh, people in the education sectors, teachers, support staff, daycare workers, those who work in food and agriculture, as well as manufacturing sectors, corrections workers, U.S. Postal Service workers, public transit, and grocery store workers. Other essential workers are listed on the right. The description of all essential workers can be found at Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, website, which is indicated below. Next slide. So to put that all together, here are the proposed phases for COVID-19 vaccination as well as their intersections. The large square is the US population 16 and older, separated out by people 75 plus, 65 to 74, and then 16 to 64 with and without high-risk medical conditions. In the light blue 
are phase 1A, healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents. In the slightly darker blue are the proposed phase B, frontline essential workers and persons 75 and older. In the darkest blue are the groups proposed for phase 1C, persons 65 to 74, essentials workers not previously recommended, and persons 16 to 64 with high-risk medical conditions. Let's now proceed to the highlights of the evidence that the workgroup considered. Next slide. To examine the policy question of which group should be recommended to receive COVID-19 vaccines in phase 1B and 1C, the workgroup considered information in three pillars, which I've presented previously, science, implementation, and ethics. Next. First, let's look at the science. Uh, the epidemiology of COVID-19 disease burden and the potential impact of the vaccine. These are national estimates of COVID-19 incidents of confirmed cases by age group. Uh, as you likely already know, COVID-19 incidence is highest in young, among young adults. Next. On the other hand, COVID-19 mortality rates are highest in older adults. As you can see, uh, the national estimates of death per 100,000 population rises steeply after age 65. Next. This graph depicts deaths from all causes and shows that uh, those in also involving uh, COVID-19 in blue. As you can see, death from all causes uh, increases with age. However, the proportion of deaths associated with COVID-19 is actually similar across middle age and older adults. Next slide. Now looking at hospitalizations. Over the course of this year, adults 75 years and older have accounted for 25% of COVID-19 associated hospitalizations, despite making up approximately 8% of the population. Next slide. If we look at hospitalization trends over time, we see that rates for 75 to 84 year olds in blue and 85 and older in red, in particular, have risen sharply over the past couple of months, far exceeding those of younger adults. Next slide. This table from a published paper featuring COVID net data shows that compared to people without underlying medical conditions, Adults with one or more condition were significantly more likely to be hospitalized for COVID-19. That risk increased if a person had multiple conditions. Older adults living in the community were also more likely to be hospitalized for COVID compared to younger adults. However, in this adjusted analysis, the magnitude of the association was smaller compared to having comorbidities. It should be noted that persons living in long-term care were excluded from the analysis. Next slide. In contrast to the previous slide, among persons hospitalized for COVID-19, risk of in-hospital death increased dramatically with age, with adjusted rate ratios ranging from 6 to 11 in age groups 65 and older. Next slide. Shifting our focus now to essential workers, this figure shows high seroprevalence among many frontline essential worker groups following the first wave of pandemic in New York City. Since these data reflect exposures that occurred before July, it's unknown to what extent these workers are still protected. Next slide. One more graph to illustrate the age distribution of essential workers and the intersection between the proposed groups. While approximately half of essential workers are older than 40 years old, 8 to 11% are actually older than 65. Also, we know that among adults 18 to 64, 56% have a medical condition or behavioral risk factor that is associated with increased risk of severe COVID. Next slide. Uh, to summarize the modeling work uh, that was done and previously presented to ACIP, in the scenarios that were considered, differences between strategies is minimal. Vaccinating older adults first averts slightly more deaths, while vaccinating younger adults first essential workers and uh, younger adults with high-risk conditions, averts slightly more infections. The work group concluded that ethical principles and implementation considerations should also contribute to the selection of the optimal sequence in phase 1b and 1c. 
the largest driver of impact in averting deaths and infections is actually the timing of the vaccine introduction related to increases in COVID-19 cases. This really emphasizes the need to continue non-pharmaceutical interventions such as wearing a mask, social distancing, to prevent cases so the vaccine can really have its maximum impact. The vaccine's ability to prevent transmission will further inform modeling analysis and interpretation. And as we saw in yesterday's presentation on the Moderna vaccine, preliminary data indicate that the vaccine may reduce transmission. However, more study is needed to be certain. Next slide. There are many impacts of COVID-19 that were actually not included in modeling because we simply don't know enough yet about this disease to include them. One major issue is late sequelae of COVID-19, colloquially referred to as long-haul COVID. Some of the more commonly long-lasting uh, symptoms include fatigue, dyspnea, or shortness of breath, cough, arthralgia, and chest pain. More serious complications appear to be less common, uh, but long-lasting medical problems may result, such as myocardial inflammation, ventricular dysfunction, or lost pulmonary dysfunction, and acute ki kidney injury, as well as others. Ultimately, even COVID-19 cases that may not result in hospital or death can still have important health consequences and need to be prevented. Next slide. Now for implementation. Next slide. Back in June, the work group proposed guiding principles, two of which pertain to implementation. Next slide. Those are efficient distribution and flexibility. During a pandemic, efficient, expeditious, and equitable distribution of administ and administration of authorized vaccines is critical. With respect to flexibility, within national guidelines, state and local jurisdictions should have flexibility to administer vaccine based on local epidemiology and demand. Dr. Sarah Oliver will speak to the details of operationalizing these principles in the next presentation. Next slide. When considering feasibility of vaccinating adults 65 and older, um, a potential challenge is uh, early in the program is potentially the long distances uh, needed to drive to central clinics and the high throughput uh, needed for these clinics. On the positive side, older adults report high intent to receive COVID-19 vaccine. And there's a wide network of physician offices, pharmacies, and public health clinics who are established providers of adult vaccination. Surveys indicate that 73 to 82% uh, who responded supported priority vaccination of persons 65 and older. Next slide. When considering implementing COVID-19 vaccination for essential workers, a potential challenge is reaching workers in rural locations, shift workers, those working multiple jobs or working in small cohorts. To overcome this, jurisdictions are working on solutions such as on-site occupational clinics, pharmacies, or health department point of dispensing strike teams. Surveys indicate that 68 to 87% supported priority vaccination of essential workers, such as police, fire, rescue, and teachers. Next slide. For adults with medical conditions that put them at increased risk of severe COVID, a potential challenge is determining el eligibility in this very large group. Again, we have the benefit of a wide vaccine vaccination provider network and healthcare homes such as physician offices or pharmacies could be better suited to verify underlying medical conditions. Surveys indicate that 68 to 84 percent supported priority vaccination of persons who are at high risk because of medical problems. Next slide. Now to consider ethics. Next slide. Vaccinating older adults maximizes benefit and minimizes harms by reducing directly the morbidity and mortality in persons with the highest or high burden of COVID-19 hospitalization and death. Promotion of justice while vaccinating this group will require focused outreach to those who experience barriers to accessing health care. It was also noted that persons living in multi-generational households may be at greater risk of exposure. With respect to mitigating health inequities, 
racial and ethnic minority groups are underrepresented among older adults. However, minorities within this group have experienced disproportionate COVID-19 related hospitalization and death. Next slide. Essential workers are at high risk because of, of exposure by virtue of being in contact with others in performing their duties. Prevention of disease in essential workers may reduce transmission to others. Um, this preserves essential uh, work essential uh, to the COVID-19 response and overall functioning of society, what we have referred to as the multiplier effect. In terms of promoting justice, it was noted that frontline workers in particular are unable to work from home and have a high level of interaction with public or others in the workplace. In fact, in some instances, they may not be able to control social distancing. This approach mitigates health inequities uh, as racial and ethnic minorities uh, groups are disproportionately represented in many essential industries, and approximately one quarter of essential workers live in low-income families. Next slide. Vaccinating persons 16 to 64 reduces morbidity and mortality in persons with moderate to high burden of COVID-19 associated hospitalization and death. Focused outreach to those with limited or no access to healthcare will be needed to promote justice in a rollout. And in terms of mitigation of health inequities, while there's an increased prevalence of some medical conditions in racial, racial or ethnic minority groups and persons in rural areas, Diagnosis of these conditions may require access to health care. Next slide. The following is a summary of work group considerations. Next. Scientific implementation and ethical considerations support inclusion of groups in phase 1B and 1C as a, in a balance of prevention of mor morbidity and mortality and preservation of societal functions. This represents an interim phase one sequence. Allocation policy will need to be dynamic and adapt as new information, uh, such as vaccine performance and supply and demand become clear. Gating criteria will be necessary to move expeditiously from one phase to the next if supply exceeds demand. Following vaccination, measures to stop the possible spread of, of SARS-CoV-2, such as masks and social distancing, will still be needed. And finally, the U.S. government is committed to making COVID-19 vaccines available to all residents as soon as possible. Next slide. This is the proposed phase one and two allocation. Phase 1B comprises frontline essential workers and persons 75 and older for a total of approximately 49 million unique persons. Next. Phase 1C comprises persons age 65 to 74 years old, persons age 16 to 64 years with high-risk medical conditions, and essential workers not recommended in Phase 1B. Once overlap among the groups is accounted for, this is approximately 129 million unique persons. Phase two consists of all people uh, 16 years and older who were not recommended in phase one. Next slide. So given the size of the proposed groups, this is an example of phase one and phase two COVID-19 vaccine rollout over time. Next slide. Again, coming full circle, this is a schema of how the different proposed groups intersect. Next slide. And the following is pro the proposed interim recommendation. As an update to ACIP recommendations for vaccination in phase 1A, healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents, if COVID-19 vaccine supply is limited, the following groups should be offered vaccination. Phase 1B, persons aged 75 years and older and frontline essential workers. Phase 1C, persons aged 65 to 74 years and persons aged 16 to 64 years with high-risk medical conditions and other essential workers. Thank you. That concludes my presentation, and I will turn it over to Dr. Romero. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Julian, for that very in-depth discussion. Uh, sorry, uh, presentation. Um, I believe that um, Dr. Oliver has a uh, 
presentation for us. Um, and we will entertain that uh, presentation before we take questions um, and comments. Dr. Oliver will talk about considerations for populations, including phase 1B and 1C. Uh, please, Dr. Oliver. Thank you. Next slide. So today I'll be briefly covering considerations for phase 1B and 1C, including transitioning between phases, sub-prioritization considerations, and other considerations for populations in phase 1B and 1C. Next slide. So first for transitioning between phases. Next slide. A strategy for transitioning between phases will be necessary to move to the next phase as supply increases and may exceed demand for the current phase. However, vaccination within the phases may and likely will overlap. This, it is not necessary to fully complete vaccination in one phase before moving to the next phase. Decisions on moving to the next phase will be made and detailed at a state or local level. Next slide. This slide lists suggested strategies for this transition between phases. When demand in the current phase is less than the vaccination capacity, this can be determined using local metrics, but an example would be if appointments to be vaccinated are less than 80% filled for several days. Another reason to move into the next phase would be if supply increases significantly, either due to more doses available of the current vaccines or if a new vaccine is authorized. And finally, considerations to move into the next phase would include if or when most persons within the current phase are vaccinated. This will obviously depend on vaccine uptake within various populations, and again, will be informed based on the state and local situation. Next slide. As was done for healthcare personnel in long-term care facilities, we wanted to provide some consideration for subprioritization. Next slide. Again, the goal is for all frontline workers to receive the vaccine. However, where subprioritization of these frontline workers is needed due to limited vaccine supply initially, Jurisdictions could consider workers in locations where high rates of transmission and or outbreaks have occurred. Also, workers who are at increased risk for severe illness based on age or underlying medical condition. However, a worker's privacy should be considered with this situation, and some workers may not want to disclose a full medical history to an employer because of that, using self-identified medical condition status may be best. And as was done for healthcare personnel, considerations could also include workers who do not have a history of documented acute SARS-CoV-2 infection in the prior 90 days. Next slide. And again, the goal is for the COVID vaccination program to extend to every corner of every community in the US, so everyone has the opportunity to receive a COVID vaccine. However, during this brief time period of constrained supply, state and local jurisdictions may have to make decisions around how the initial supplies of COVID vaccine will be distributed. I want to highlight that the MMWR describing the ethical principles used as a component for these decisions includes a table with very practical questions that state and local jurisdictions can use to make decisions around this planning. Next slide. And finally, for other considerations for phase 1B and 1C. Next slide. mRNA vaccines are currently not recommended for outbreak management or for post-exposure prophylaxis, which is vaccination to prevent the development of SARS-CoV-2 infection in a person with a specific known exposure. Both available mRNA vaccines are a two-dose series. Protection from these vaccines is not immediate. It takes one to two weeks following the second dose before a person is considered fully vaccinated. And with a median incubation period of four to five days, it is unlikely that 
vaccination would prevent disease from a singular specific exposure. However, based on local epidemiology and implementation considerations, jurisdictions may choose to vaccinate frontline essential workers and persons who reside at congregate living facilities, such as prisons, jails, or homeless shelters at the same time. Next slide. The epidemiology of COVID-19 is constantly evolving. Our knowledge of the currently available vaccines will increase, and additional vaccines may be authorized or authorization may expand to other populations or ages over time. These considerations and additional guidance for phase 1b, 1c, and phase 2 will be updated as we see this changing COVID-19 epidemiology and learn more around the current and upcoming COVID-19 vaccines. Next slide. Thanks, and we'll turn it over for discussion. Thank you very much, all, Dr. Oliver, for that presentation as always, uh, clear, lucid. Um, so this uh, presentation and the one prior to it are open for discussion. Um, let me pull up our list of individuals. Um, so hands are coming up. Um, let, let me open with a question and, and, um, and a comment either from you or from other members of the, of the um, voting group. So um, we have now had over the last um, two months introduction of monoclonal antibodies that um, can be used as an out, in an outpatient setting and really are designed to be used in an outpatient setting um, and um, may uh, impact on uh, hospitalization and mortality. Um, has that I, I, were, were those factored in any way into this and, and their development and, and um, provision throughout the country? And uh, do, would they have an impact on, on uh, the projections over time? Over. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Um, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're uh, asking about uh, other expert committees that have um, uh, weighed in with uh, recommendations for allocation of vaccine? Well, I'm speaking primarily, we now have some therapies that can be used as an out, in an outpatient setting that may, may impact on, on um, mortality and hospitalization. And were, were those at all taken into consideration in, in uh, setting up these, these, uh, these uh, groups? Uh, so the work group didn't specifically consider the use of uh, mon monoclonal antibodies, either uh, as an adjunct or another strategy for the prevention of COVID. Um, I can uh, turn the uh, question over to uh, Dr. Bell if she has any other additional comments on that. It's primarily the impact of these of these therapies uh, on the projections. That's that's all it was, if any. Uh, yeah, thank you. No, we we haven't as yet um, considered um, that, and I'm not sure that um, given um, the extent of use of monoclonal antibodies right now, that it's likely to have an impact for the moment. But it is another uh, factor I think that we will need to consider and monitor over time, and it's a, you know one of the many considerations of things that might change that could affect uh, how we look at vaccine, vaccine uh, allocation in the future. Thank you, and thank you for indulging my question. Um, so, uh, Dr. Salaji, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Drs. Dooling and Oliver, for an excellent, thoughtful presentation, as always. <clears throat> I, I first wanted to just say that I um, really agree with this uh, modification of our prioritization. I think it uh, clearly, it more clearly co uh, goes along with the National Academy of Science and Medicine framework. And I like the concept of sub-prioritizing within essential workers to um, frontline and other essential workers. I could tell you um, in Los Angeles County where uh, the county has been working very diligently on allocating uh, on deciding what to do with the 10.5 million residents, there has been a lot of interest in sub-prioritizing essential workers. Um, and this issue with frontline workers, I think, goes very uh, much along with what the county would want. And I've also been worried about 
the over 75 year old or the older uh, adult. I do have a question about <clears throat> minority individuals. I know one of the reasons that I was favoring essential workers is the disproportionate number of individuals who are minority in the overall group of essential workers. I'm assuming that's the same, that there's also a disproportionate number of minority individuals in frontline essential workers. But do we have data about that? We do have data about that from the American Community Survey. And in brief, I can say that frontline essential workers um, more closely model the uh, racial makeup of the total U.S. population. And we see that disproportionate uh, representation of minorities in the other essential workers. Okay. Um, the, the other, I guess related to that, the other point I was going, I wanted to make is <clears throat> I agree with this concept of some flexibility within local regions and counties. Um, and as part of flexibility, I, I just want to emphasize that areas, communities, sub-communities, at-risk communities who live in very vulnerable areas, and these are low-income primarily or often minority uh, individuals who live in these communities, need special outreach and, and additional efforts to reach these individuals uh, because of the access barriers to vaccination. So, Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I was having trouble getting off mute. Uh, Dr. Hunter, please. Hi, Paul Hunter, a voting member from Wisconsin. Thanks so much for this wonderful presentation. I also very strongly agree with the specifics of how the uh, um, policy question is uh, written. and. I wanted to also ask a question eventually at the end about algorithms, but first, I think you guys have really done a great job of um, giving enough specificity um, uh, and at the same time giving some general principles so that states and local health departments can use uh, both the specifics and the principles to um, uh, further define this for their states. And then um, there are all those principles and specifics can even be used within um, employers and uh, by employers, by employee groups um, uh, to come up with specifics of how it should be implemented in their area. So that I think you've done a great job of balancing what the role um, has traditionally been of um, federal public health, uh, uh, issuing guidelines that the state and locals um, really um, implement. I, uh, my question about the algorithm is, um, I'm familiar with a health system that I'm part of that uses um, a lot of what you're talking about in principles in three um, um, basically criteria that they use to uh, sub prioritize into four tiers <clears throat> within healthcare personnel. And I'm wondering whether this um, kind of uh, three criteria, in spe specifically, if you'd comment on whether this might be a good idea for other groups to consider, um, whether there's some uh, things that you've considered about this, these three criteria that are missing or um, uh, aren't quite the way. Uh, fit into the principles that you've outlined or whether it is a good idea. Specifically, that is um, the criteria that I'm familiar with being used to uh, sub-prioritize healthcare workers um, are age, um, a supervisor's uh, description of the employee's job duties, and then um, CDC's Social Vulnerability Index, which um, I, I assume takes the um, employee's residence and um, maps that onto census tract and then gets the um, Social Vulnerability Index number that has, uh, based on the 15 criteria you guys um, developed for that within the CDC. So if you could comment on that algorithm, I'd, uh, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. 
Hello, Dr. Hunter. This is uh, Dr. Dooling. Um, so those three uh, elements that you uh, outlined, age, in other words, the underlying risk uh, for severe disease and death in, a, in an individual, a description of the risk that they may encounter in the course of their work, and then additionally, the social vulnerability index are uh, all things that uh, the work group has spoken about and that can be found in, in different ways in the clinical considerations that will accompany um, the recommendation. So um, yes, affirmative, all important, and can be used in subprioritization. Anything missing from that? Um, I, you know, not off the top of my head, and obviously that the flexibility to, to implement in every uh, location will be a little bit different. And uh, as I mentioned, there will be uh, a lot more detail coming in the uh, clinical considerations document that will accompany uh, the recommendation. Great. Again, thanks so much for the specific recommendations. Really um, helps in the implementation at the local and state level, as far as I can see in, in the stuff I do here in Wisconsin. So I really appreciate it. Again, how much you guys care about us in the real world and uh, the people we serve. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Dushan. Thank you very much. I'm trying to pull up my materials at the moment. Can, can you give me just one sec? Okay, I'm good. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Thank you very much, Dr. Romero. Um, I want to speak for a minute about program implementation, which we've been discussing, which is so critical. ACIP's recommendation yesterday for use of the second safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine in as many weeks is another crucial milestone in eventually ending this terrible pandemic that continues to roil our country in so many ways. But we must remember that a COVID-19 vaccination program is not just about vaccines, but about vaccinations, getting those vaccines to the people who need them. And today, state and local public health departments are on life support were hamstrung and stymied by the lack of necessary federal funding to allow us to take advantage of these newly available vaccines. For example, resources are needed for public health vaccination clinics to ensure equitable access to vaccines across communities and populations, for coordination and enrollment of provision and provision of support and technical assistance to healthcare providers around clinical guidance and vaccine allocation, and for the critical work of public engagement and communication. <clears throat> Operation Warp Speed has delivered two Cadillac vaccines to us, but they've come with empty gas tanks, and we have a long and difficult road ahead of us. There is a critical and immediate need for adequate funding and resources for vaccine program implementation so that as many people across our nation as possible are able to realize the full potential of these highly effective COVID-19 vaccines and realize the commitment we've heard about today that the federal government has to make them available as quickly, as efficiently, expeditiously, and equitably as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dushan. Dr. Zahn. Uh, thank you, Dr. Romero. Can you hear me? I can. Please go for it. All right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, like uh, as, as the others, uh, uh, Comments, commenters have said, I um, think these, uh, this algorithm, this framework in 1B and 1C makes sense to me. I, I think it's uh, really going to be very useful for local public health to prioritize who receives limited vaccines initially. Um, I, I, and so I, I congratulate and appreciate uh, all the work uh, the work group's been doing and, and CDC. Um, a, a couple of comments. One is that this framework, I think, will be very is very helpful as described to help local public health and local government and industry understand who's prioritized. I think it's also going to be extremely important to make sure that uh, the community individuals understand where they fit into it. And so I think I know we're all probably thinking about this, but we have to translate this to some relatively simple bullet points so people can self-identify. Yes, I nominally work in manufacturing, but I'm probably at lower risk versus I am in that industry and I'm much higher risk. So we really have to make sure that people understand individually. Um, 
exactly where they fit into this so they can they can uh, seek vaccination. Um, I, I, I think everybody could guess, but I think it's worth saying out loud that uh, local public health has little enthusiasm for eventually being a traffic cop, so to speak, for every individual who may get vaccinated or not get vaccinated. I'm sure healthcare providers feel the same way. I think this, uh, this algorithm makes sense, but I think we also have to understand that we're going to assume that individuals are going to recognize they are at risk, reach out to their providers and get vaccinated. And the provider's job, public health job, is not going to say this person should or should not get vaccinated. We're going to have to rely on on, on people to outreach appropriately. Um, I think that what is public health job, it's terribly important, is uh, what Dr. Dooling uh, mentioned in her excellent presentation, focused outreach. And uh, you know, as Dr. Dushin just said, uh, I think particularly the outreach to essential workers, I think this is a really important and noble goal, but it, it remains just a sentiment unless we have funding, federal funding to make that come alive, make that live and breathe on the local level. So federal funding is terribly important. I can't emphasize enough that we are really, we are behind right now, uh, you know, weeks or months in our preparations to really do this right. So it, it, it's just terribly important. Um, but, I, you know, I, again, uh, so much appreciate CDC's work and, uh, and the work of ACIP uh, to make this come together in this algorithm. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, let me um, call on some uh, voting members, all the liaisons that have their hands up. Um, please don't take them down. Uh, we're just going to move to the uh, voting members who did not have their hands up when you put yours up. Uh, and we'll come right back to you. Uh, Dr. Fry, please. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Uh, I'd like to take a minute to thank Dr. Dooling and Dr. Oliver for excellent presentations and also the uh, working group and CDC and everybody involved in this effort for the thoughtfulness uh, and the amount of work that they have uh, done on behalf of our multiple communities within our country, for our country and others. So I, this is a question of clarification, and I guess I'll address this to Dr. Oliver. I think it was your second last slide. Uh, there was an example of local authorities obviously being able to um, prioritize within their groups or maximize the vaccination effort as the demand and the supply of vaccine uh, varies. And so there was the example I'm referring to is the one of vaccinating correctional officers uh, as essential workers and also then uh, the um, residents of the facilities as um, living in long-term care facilities and the ability to vaccinate both groups at the same time. And I just wanted to make sure we were then thinking about vaccinating both groups at the same time or having the possibility of vaccinating both groups at the same time during a phase 1B effort. I want to make sure I understood that correctly. And then also uh, sort of a second half of that question would be if uh, the residents were vaccinated as group in phase 1C, how would that occur? Because some, uh, some people will be el very elder as elderly, some will have a um, certain amount of co underlying comorbidities and um, and all these groups are uh, within the various facilities are very vulnerable through, for multiple reasons. And so if you could just clarify that uh, for me, I would be most appreciative. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Fry. This is this is Dr. Oliver. Um, it, so you interpreted it correctly. We we did want to emphasize um, that we're not recommending um, the mRNA vaccines as kind of a tool for a singular point source outbreak. Um, but if based on kind of the global epidemiology at the local um, 
as, you know, state or uh, jurisdiction, uh, there was a decision that, um, you know, based on on outbreaks or rates of transmission broadly, um, that the um, implementation um, and kind of the, the current status of disease would facilitate um, having broader access and, and vaccinating the um, both the, the prisoners or the people at, at home, the, that are residing in the homeless shelters um, at the same time, um, that that could be done. Um, and so that would absolutely be based on kind of the, uh, the local epidemiology and, and local decisions made. And this is Dr. Cohn. I'll just add to that. I think um, this is the exact reason why um, we want to have this flexibility so that you are not having to split up, for example, residents in a homeless shelter into phases 1B and 1C. Uh, but at the time, um, you know, depending on how many doses you had available, you could either choose to vaccinate staff and all the residents at the same time, or if necessary, separate it out and vaccinate uh, staff uh, in 1B and older adults in 1B and then uh, hold out for the rest of the facility into 1C. But but this would give uh, local jurisdictions the option to go either way, depending on all of the different variables. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you, Jose. Um, I also really want to thank um, the working group and, of course, CDC, because um, it's uh, for their incredible effort and and thought process of all of this because um, it is really difficult. As I sit here and and look at the at the phases, um, certainly I want to vaccinate all one A, one B, one C. I mean, it's all of them are high risk. Um, but I also um, do agree that the prioritization among essential workers and also even among those in those in one C will be important depending on the vaccine supply. And I'm glad that it can be decided or at least can be worked through at local and state levels. Um, because when I look at, at some of the persons who are age 65 to 74 and those who, with high risk, um, yes, by age they are, but I think it also is different if the 65 to 70 four year old or those with medical conditions are having to, for instance, to work in a, in a crowded workplace versus those who can work from home. And so some of that thinking uh, will need to be implemented because someone who can quarantine at home as much as possible, certainly the risk would be certainly less and those who may not be essential, but some were some they do have to go into the workplace. And so I think those are going to be kind of difficult to sort through. And without having the and whoever is giving the vaccine being, you know, guard as to no, you don't qualify, if it's going to be a difficult process. But we certainly need as much direction from um, you know, from us as much as possible. Thank you. And including those who are retired, I mean, some some of those are retired, um, you know, who are over 65, and you know, I, I guess they, if they were to get, um, so I mean, one thing is the severity, and the other thing is the exposure, and um, and those who will have less exposure may maybe not may not be relegated to the front line either. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Um, Dr. Goldman. Thank you, Dr. Romero. First, as always, Dr. Oliver, Dr. Dooling, incredible presentation. Thank you, as always, for all of your hard work. Um, a lot of what I was going to say, Dr. Dushin, so eloquently already stated, so I want to echo his comments on implementation and great concern I have with recent lessons learned from the initial phase in rollout and the issue of sub-prioritization that can become a double-edged sword as a path of least resistance to make the allocation and equitable distribution even more inequitable. As some localities are using it to uh, vaccinate those in the easiest uh, method possible, but not necessarily those at highest risk. And I once again want to stress the importance 
of the frontline workers in outpatient medical centers, physician offices, the medical assistants, the front desk, the clerical staff who don't have access to PPEs, who are on the front lines being exposed to the patients, but there does not seem to be in many localities the um, outreach, the uh, education, the ability to get those vaccines to those where it is needed most. So in addition to the importance of federal support, federal funding, and I know it may be out of the scope of this committee, but the importance of oversight and that we've created this remarkable feat of science to get this vaccine out uh, as quickly as possible. But it doesn't help if it doesn't get to the people we need it to get to as quickly as possible. And my concern is that many localities are not truly following these guidelines uh, in the way they were intended to make sure that those most at risk and most vulnerable get the vaccines where it's needed. That being said, with this phased allocation, I do uh, applaud and stress the work of the vaccine work group. And I think this is a very balanced approach for phase 1B. And I think that it is the right path of uh, both balancing the needs of society versus those most at risk for bad outcome from disease. But in summary, I want to once again stress the importance of making sure these guidelines are really looked at by those localities so that we get the vaccine where it is needed most and that we do not forget those most at risk, especially the essential workers, the front desk workers, and medical staff, medical clinics, physician offices, and the need for us to vaccinate everyone. Thank you. Over. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. Uh, Ms. McNally. Thank you. I was wondering if the work group considered whether the clinical considerations would address uh, both state and federal workers in the appropriate categories. So, for example, in the category of legal, I'm thinking about uh, the difference between state and federal court judges. Thank you. This is uh, Dr. Dooling. That's an excellent question. And uh, the um, CISA list of uh, essential and critical infrastructure does not uh, distinguish between state and uh, federal or local. Um, if you fall into that sector, uh, then you would be eligible. Thank you. Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you. Um, my thanks also to Dr. Dooling and Dr. Oliver. Um, I have to say this has been a um, complex set of discussions with multiple considerations. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, you know, I, I truly believe our goal is to make sure that we can uh, vaccinate everyone um, who wants a vaccine. Uh, and so this is just hopefully a path to get there. And it's, I'm hoping this is only a short term situation. I wanted to reflect on um, uh, the importance of the balanced considerations for phase 1B. Um, I, I do uh, feel at, at this point we are in a different place in the pandemic than we were a month or two ago. And I am very worried about healthcare capacity. Um, so in my mind, the, the approach of uh, making sure that we are uh, um, simultaneously considering um, uh, risk of infection and risk of hospitalizations and death in a balanced manner, I think is really important and also agree with the very um, excellent point that we have not yet seen enough data on long-term sequelae. So I, I believe that there's more to come on understanding the morbidity associated with infection um, that may not always be reflected in the hospitalization rate and the death rate. Um, I, I think that the reason for the um, 75 and older, uh, um, including that group in phase 1B makes a lot of sense given the data presented on uh, risk of hospitalizations and risk of death by age. Um, so, you know, in a, in a sense, not only is it um, ensuring that we are maximizing the benefits uh, for an incredibly high risk population, but in my mind that also potentially has a multiplier effect in that if we are on the tipping point in some of our healthcare systems with regard to capacity, um, those death rates get multiplied because of um, issues with healthcare capacity. Um, so I, I do think we're going to have to pay close attention to where things are uh, with capacity as the uh, pandemic evolves, and we may need to be flexible again going forward. Um, in, with regard to essential workers, I, um, I, I do want to just highlight the, um, the key points that are important, at least from my perspective. Um, I do feel that it's in incredibly important to uh, focus in on the front line 
health essential workers, um, those who need to get their jobs done and cannot do it um, without uh, interacting with the public or uh, with other staff. Uh, and I also uh, you know, worry that not all industries have sufficient resources for mitigation in place. And so the risk of infection does remain high for our frontline workers. Um, I also think that it's important to call out that um, where health and economic disparities are prominent, we also need to uh, remain focused on addressing those disparities. I, um, and I am hopeful that by focusing in on these um, frontline essential workers, that in particular, uh, we can uh, ensure that efficient and equitable allocation remains at the forefront um, in this category. Um, and also, uh, of course, you know, as mentioned before, uh, for essential workers where we have enough information to understand that the risk, again, frontline essential workers where the risk for us hospitalization and death are high, I, again, um, want to emphasize that, um, of course, that would be uh, if we have to sub-prioritize, even in the sub-prioritization categories, that those are the ones that come to mind for me at this moment in terms of being uh, where to emphasize the efforts on implementation. Um, I am hoping that by the time phase 1C and phase 2 come along that we will have enough doses. Um, I did want to reflect that if for some reason we don't have enough doses at the time those phases are ready to roll out, that phase C may, 1C may still be too large. Um, and so just as we had to reconsider phase 1A and fun, phase 1B in the context of the current pandemic, I think we have to be prepared to adapt um, in future phases because um, we don't know where we're going to be in another month as those phases roll out. And so I think we should continuously incorporate the data that we're seeing um, so that we can uh, adapt as needed uh, those recommendations um, I'm, uh, if, if we are voting on both today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, just make the statement that uh, I assure you that there's plenty of time for comments. So if I skip over you, um, I will come back. Um, and I want to remind people that if you've already spoken and have no, uh, no other comments, please lower your hand so that um, it's easier to see who, who needs to be uh, called upon. So let me move to Dr. Atmar. Dr. Atmar, please. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Uh, I also want to add my uh, congratulations to Dr. Stewing and Oliver and, and to the work group for giving us a, a framework um, to address a very difficult uh, question and problem. As I've sat here and listened to the discussion, um, one of the things that I've become concerned about is that, you know, based on the different groups that will be included in 1B, there will need to be different strategies to reach out to those groups to get them um, vaccinated, and the propose and and we've also heard that the resources available to um, many of the uh, public health entities uh, across our nation are already uh, quite stressed, and the ability to reach out um, to a large number of you know different target groups is potentially problematic. Um, I understand that the solutions need to be local, um, but the, there also is the potential for um, local abuse that as, um, as schedules are not built, um, you know, based on our guidance, it's reasonable to, to move to um, other groups. And so I could see in one community, um, uh, given vaccine supply, uh, groups 1B and 1C could be moved through very quickly and, uh, you know, start vaccinating those individuals remaining, while in other uh, communities, um, it remains that uh, persons in Group 1B would continue to be vaccinated. I, I'm not sure what the plans are to monitor this at a at a state um, and federal level, um, but and I don't have any solutions. Um, all I can do is point out the the potential problem and ask uh, 
uh, whether the work group has considered that and, and whether maybe they might have some solutions that I can't put my finger on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Talbot, please. Thank you. Um, I think I really, but there's so much to say because um, this is such a hard decision. Um, but I think I really want to highlight something that Jeff Dushin said. Um, um, and I am ever thankful for our essential workers. I have a teenage boy that drinks a gallon of milk a day. Um, and without the front facing critical workers who are still on the farms, who are still processing the milk and getting it to the grocery store, um, it would be difficult in our home. And it's not just the milk, it's all of it. Um, so I feel very strongly that we do need to have that balance of saving lives and keeping our infrastructure in place. Um, but to Jeff Dushin's point is, it's easy for us to give vaccine in our clinics. It's not easy for us to give vaccines to the people who are on the front lines for multiple reasons. One is um, they have to take off time from work to do that. That's unpaid time that most of them cannot afford because they're not able to pay their bills. Two is if they do have fever post-vaccination, they have to take more time off work. So I guess I'm really talking to our senators and congressmen, and I hope that if they're not listening, their staff is listening today, that this is critical, that we need to be working with the White House to fund our state health department to get vaccine out so that everyone can continue to get their milk and eggs um, uh, and move that forward. Um, I have been very impressed with many of the private groups that have come forward that have offered to help our states. And I think this is where we're gonna shine as Americans, that we're gonna have to do a lot of public private partnerships to make this happen. I think companies are gonna have to open their doors to immunizers. Um, but I think that's going to take uh, state funding of the state to be able to go out and supply staff to do this kind of immunization. So for our senators and congressmen who are listening, um, please pay attention to this and please realize that we need the funding to move America past this outbreak um, and that we love our vaccine that was funded. Both of them are phenomenal, um, but we ask that you fund it out into the community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bata. Um, thank you. And I do want to echo the, um, the work of Dr. Dewing and Dr. Oliver in articulating the work group's uh, sentiments. Thank you very much for um, this present, these presentations. It's, it's very clear to me. Um, one question that I have, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to look at the, the various groups um, and, I do, and um, examples, but I'm not seeing congregate living settings, congregate settings. Can you help me understand where they fit into these um, phases? Thank you, Dr. Bhatta. Um, so congregate settings fit in in a, in a number of ways. Uh, corrections officers, corrections workers were specifically called out as frontline essential workers. Um, Additional other workers that work in congregate settings uh, may be included as essential workers in phase 1C. Uh, Dr. Oliver then presented that based on local decision making, if the epidemiolo epidemiology is such uh, and the implementation factors both favor uh, vaccinating workers and residents within a given congregate setting, be that prison, jail, or a homeless shelter, um, that that is, is possible uh, under the, the clinical considerations and, and general flexibility of, of recommendations. Thank you. Dr. Bernstein. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have to say that the task of creating a plan is so much more difficult than critiquing a plan. So I give kudos and sincere gratitude for the wonderful work of doctors uh, Dooling and Oliver and the additional talented, bright and insightful CDC folks 
and the entire uh, COVID-19 uh, work group. For me, I'm struggling a little bit with the, with the numbers here. We heard from Dr. Messonnier early on that there is basically going to be 100 million doses available in December, January, and February, which in turn will accommodate 50 million individuals, assuming they all accept it. And then when I look at the numbers that are available, the healthcare personnel, the long-term care facility residents, the frontline essential workers, that's uh, 54 million just there. And then we're um, adding 53 million uh, individuals who are 75 years of age and older, and then 65 to 74. So I'm wondering how how moving from one group to the other it has been factored in or modeled as far as acceptance of the vaccine by these various uh, groups. Yeah. Dr. Bernstein, this is uh, Dr. Cohn. Uh, that's, thank you for this question. It's a great opportunity to clarify. So Dr. Messonnier, uh, uh comments were related to the number of individuals uh, that we will have t a two-dose series available for uh, by the end of each month. So it doesn't mean that that's the number of individuals who will be vaccinated in that month, but it's by the end of December, we will have enough doses to vaccinate nearly 20 million people. By the end of January, we'll have enough doses to vaccinate nearly 30 million additional people. Um, and then by the end of February, um, 50 million additional people. Um, so that will help you understand these numbers potentially a little bit more. Um, but we, um, your comment about what will uptake be in these populations is uh, one we uh, have not really modeled into the, when we think, you know, the size of the group 1C, for example, um, it's, it's more related to the gating criteria and how quickly you're able to move through these groups. Um, we obviously hope that uptake will be very high. It may also not be very high immediately. So for example, you might have um, a, you might have 70 persons, 75 years of age and older, you might have a huge number of those individuals get vaccinated immediately. Um, but then um, demand in that age group may get lower and people are still coming in to get vaccinated, but you have enough doses to move down to 65, if that makes sense. So it, it's not, we didn't model um, these numbers based off of the number of doses, because we do know that there will be variation in uptake. Um, but we did try to keep 1B relatively, um, we didn't want to overwhelm demand based on the number of doses that we have available over the next, uh, over January and February. Um, but we are hopeful that uh, we will have enough doses to uh, vaccinate uh, through these groups um, sometime uh, end of January, early February for the phase 1B individuals. Thank, thank you, Dr. Cohn. I, I was just trying to do it as a, as a balance sheet because um, I'm separating out the uh, 75 plus versus the 65 to 74 year olds that I mean their mo mortality is uh, notably higher uh, and so the healthcare personnel long-term care facility residents essential workers and uh, those 65 and older would balance uh, would essentially be that hundred million do uh, individuals that could be covered in the next three months if there was 100% acceptance. Thank you. So can I, can I just ask Dr. Bernstein, are you, are you um, suggesting that uh, ACIP could consider adding persons aged 65 plus into that phase 1B? Is that what you're getting at? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Paling. Thank you. Um, I want to also express my thanks to Dr. Oliver 
Dr. Dooling and the entire work group for these very clear presentations um, and thinking about a path to vaccinate all who want to be vaccinated. We all hope that vaccine supply will be higher, faster than expected because these decisions are really wrenching right now. I might agree with the balance of morbidity and mortality and preservation of societal function. And if I understand correctly, um, the 75-year-old plus represents 8% of the population, 25% of the hospitalizations are and have the highest death rate. And then the frontline essential workers have the highest exposure, um, have the exposure. And we know that the race ethnic um, disparities are attributable to increased exposure. And it also addresses the disproportionate hospitalizations and that um, the um, race ethnic disparities um, relate to between one and two high risk conditions for hospitalization rates. Um, and then to get to what many have um, reiterated and what Dr. Cohen just said, to have two doses of vaccine for 50 million people by the end of January and 100 million doses by the end of February, there's going to be an uh, incredible amount of support to our public health infrastructure to be able to meet this opportunity. And the faster we meet this opportunity, the um, the healthier um, the United States will be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank our liaison members who have been waiting patiently. Let me go back to the top of the list. Dr. Gluckman, please. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Bob Gluckman, AHIP. I'd also like to thank Drs. Dooling and Oliver, the members of the uh, work group, and also the uh, voting members of ACIP who have a, a difficult responsibility here. I'd like to uh, kind of echo some of the comments made by Dr. Sanchez and Lee, and specifically, I have a, a, a two questions. The first question has to do with the definition of uh, essential workers not recommended in phase 1B, the other essential workers. From an equity perspective, when I look at some of those professions, many of those people may work completely in a complete remote setting. I'm wondering if we should call out remote workers who don't meet other criteria for uh, high risk conditions to be considered in phase two, because uh, I would have concerns that uh, 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 people who um, are uh, in low income areas, uh, minorities, uh, uh, high risk racial groups might be at higher risk than people who can protect themselves by the nature of their profession, but be completely remote. So the first, the first question is, should remote workers be called out as to not being included in phase 1C? The, the second is, uh, I've been asked you know, by uh, uh, folks about some of the definitions of high-risk conditions. And, and um, if, there, if the uh, committee over time, as we get closer to 1C, can be more explicit about uh, um, medical risks for high-risk conditions, specifically the one I was asked about was adults with developmental delay. You know, if they're in a congregate setting, uh, you know, that's clearly called out. But I, I have no idea if young people uh, with developmental delay are uh, considered to be in a high-risk condition simply because of the nature uh, of, of that condition. So those were the two questions. But uh, the, the, um, the one that I think is most important for the committee to consider is this issue of remote workers. And thank you very much. Hi, this is Dr. Dooling. Thank you for that excellent question. And uh, we're um, how to handle workers who can do their job either entirely or mostly uh, from home definitely was something that the work group struggled with. Um, and I, I welcome uh, input from, from other ACIP voting members and, and liaisons on uh, where, uh, you know, direction on that point. To your second question about high-risk conditions, uh, we have relied on the ongoing uh, review of the literature that CDC does to determine which conditions uh, are associated with increased risk of COVID severity. Um, and at this time, there, there are 11 of them, and they are uh, con constantly uh, reviewing the literature to assess which, uh, which conditions meet that bar of evidence. Thank you. Dr. Weiser. Good morning, and thank you for the chance to uh, provide a comment. 
Uh, the Indian Health Service is the federal agency that's charged with upholding the federal trust responsibility to tribal nations across the country. <clears throat> As many of you know, data from 14 states was recently published in the NMWR on December 11th, and it demonstrated age-adjusted COVID-19 associated mortality among American Indians and Alaska Natives was 1.8 times that of non-Hispanic whites. The risk of hospitalization and death associated with COVID-19 increased with age for both races and was higher for American Indians and Alaska Natives compared to whites. The relative disparity in mortality though was greatest for those who are aged 20 to 49 years. Among those in the 20 to 29 year age group, 30 to 39 year age group and 40 to 49 year age group, the COVID-19 mortality rates among American Indians, Alaska Natives were 10.5, 11.6 and 8.2 times respectively those among white persons. The burden of underlying diseases such as diabetes and obesity, heart disease and chronic lung disease occurs in American Indians and Alaska Natives at much younger ages and is likely to be a major contributing factor to this disparity. Through Operation Warp Speed, the US government has considered IHS as a jurisdiction like states and has provided tribes the option to receive COVID-19 vaccinations through either IHS or their states. And given the disparity in rates of infection, hospitalization and death experienced by American Indians and Alaska Natives, and the unique government to government relationship between the federal government and Indian tribes, consideration should be given to prioritize vaccines for American Indian and Alaska Native people when supplies are scarce. Recognizing that ACIP is, re is reluctant to make a race-based preference it's important to note that the Indian tribes have a political, not a racial status. And there's an existing healthcare infrastructure specifically for American Indian and Alaska Native people that can be leveraged. With these considerations in mind, every effort must be made to ensure that not only the vaccine, but the resources to distribute and administer vaccines for American Indian and Alaska Native people are provided to address these important disparities regardless of which jurisdiction, IHS or state, is supplying vaccines for American Indian and Alaska Native people. Thank you for the chance to comment. Thanks, Dr. Weiser. This is Dr. Cohn. I just um, want to say we really appreciate uh, both your comment and the challenges uh, in, uh, in uh, American Indian and Alaska Native population, uh, Native American and Alaska it, sorry, populations. Um, I, I do want to clarify one thing um, for both both for, for you as well as everyone listening. Um, allocations are different than how we're setting up prioritization. So the prioritization that ACIP will be voting on today is meant to provide um, high level recommendations uh, for uh, where uh, state and jurisdictions should allocate their doses of vaccine, um, knowing that there is flexibility when different circumstances, um, uh, w when there's different circumstances in different communities. Allocation, however, is um, being done, um, those decisions are being made um, by Operation Warp Speed, and uh, a decision has been made up to this point that those allocations are being made in Colorado. So um, we understand um, your concern, uh, but, and, and but do want to make sure everybody understands that ACIP prioritization does not impact the allocation of doses to jurisdictions. Thanks. Thank you for that clarification, uh, Dr. Cohn. Um, Dr. Howell, please. Uh, hi, Molly Howell, representing the Association of Immunization Managers. I just wanted to express my gratitude on behalf of AIM for this additional guidance and consideration. I would like to provide some context for what the 64 awardees are currently facing in terms of prioritizing vaccine at local and state levels. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, we're receiving multiple emails and phone calls from different employer groups and high-risk individuals wanting to be a priority for vaccination. And it is refreshing to see the interest in vaccination, but does place us in a, a very difficult position. 
Uh, we did survey our 64 members regarding phase 1B and C uh, and received 25 responses. I will say the survey was done prior to the information presented today, uh, but 59% of members preferred vaccinating 65 and older and those with underlying health conditions first. 41% uh, said essential workers. And in the comments, many did say they planned on doing a combination of the two. Uh, at the November ACIP meeting, uh, results from a Harris poll were presented showing public support for prioritizing healthcare workers, seniors, and immunocompromised individuals. Uh, and so I do think we will need some very clear communication uh, and talking points as to why frontline essential workers who may be younger and healthier uh, are being vaccinated over older individuals and those with multiple underlying health conditions. 68% uh, of our membership reported being concerned about communications around that. Uh, the considerations that were presented today will be helpful in making decisions around prioritization of limited vaccine. Um, and 76% and of our members did say they wanted that guidance regarding further prioritization of essential workers. I do want to say more guidance regarding other congregate settings, including homeless shelters, drug treatment centers, corrections would be appreciated. If staff choose not to be vaccinated, that leaves residents vulnerable to COVID-19, uh, many of which have underlying health conditions. And logistically, it is much easier to vaccinate staff and residents at the same time. Many awardees have already started creating their own priorities, and it's very likely that states may differ in prioritization, which will make communicating with the public difficult and confusing. Um, I also wanted to mention, based on a, another comment, a uh, priority group is not something that is documented at the time of vaccination or generally documented in immunization information systems. So it will be not possible to enforce prioritization and it will be difficult to determine uptake amongst these priority groups um, if they're not age-based. And for planning purposes, I do encourage the committee to vote on both 1B and 1C so we can prioritize vaccination into the future. Um, but I do want to thank you for the additional sub-prioritization and the considerations that were presented today. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. Dr. Uh, Arthur, please. Thank you so much for the, the opportunity to add a few comments. Uh, first, thanks so much to the working group and the CDC. This is an amazingly complicated set of issues and, and the thoughtful approach is much, much appreciated. Um, I actually just wanted to say a little about the manufacturing category in the frontline essential workers. So obviously at Bio, we represent those companies that are making key medicines as well as food and agriculture products. Um, and obviously, we are, many of our workers are part of the Homeland Security Essential Critical Infrastructure Workers. So I would just ask that uh, we clarify for states, those workers within manufacturing that are key to infrastructure, those who are making uh, medicines, those who are doing food and agriculture products, those that are making PPE, so that uh, governors and states can allocate doses to those populations as well who are manufacturing products that are needed for healthcare and other places. So we actually submitted a comment to the docket on this, but I wanted to make that case um, to the group as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as a reminder to all uh, persons making comments or, or asking questions, please indicate uh, your affiliation uh, when you speak. Um, uh, Dr. De Palma, please. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, this is Dr. Sandra De Palma with the American Academy of PAs, and I want to first um, thank the committee members and everyone behind the scenes supporting those members for this important work you're doing and for the opportunity um, to be on these calls and to um, speak. Our organization has heard from many PA schools um, that thousands of PA students are having their education delayed because health systems are afraid of exposing students to COVID and also of exposing patients to students who may be infected. So there are thousands of PAs um, who, like physicians and NPs, will go on to work in hospitals, emergency departments, primary care, and other specialties who will be delayed in entering the healthcare workforce. 
many of these students are young and healthy and would fall into the group two um, for vaccines. And as important as it is um, that I recognize it's to get the vaccines to older persons and frontline workers, I'm hoping you will consider adding PA and other healthcare students to 1B or 1C so they can graduate and help with the current health crisis. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks. Um, th this is uh, this is Dr. Cohn. I just thanks for that comment. I do want to clarify though that in Phase One A, the definition of healthcare personnel does include paid and unpaid healthcare personnel, which would include students. Um, so while there may be some confusion about that, it, those groups would be included in Phase One A. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think a lot of health systems um, aren't making the vaccines available um, to those students. But um, thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hahn. Thank you, Dr. Hahn, representing uh, the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Um, I want to follow up. Um, I really, uh, the speaker from Ames said a lot of things that I was going to say, so I'll keep it really short. As a state um, health, health person, <laughs> Uh, what I fear the most is sort of a paralysis by analysis. That is that uh, as we worry so much and, and rightly so about equity and fairness that uh, locals, as they get the vaccine, are afraid to move forward or move on to another group, even if they're slowing down uh, because they're worried about that sense of inequity. Like, wait, there's this other part of the state where they're not, we haven't started to vaccinate, let's say, grocery workers or this subgroup. Um, and of course, across the nation. And I would propose there is no way we're going to be able to all stay lockstep. And, and we need to message clearly that it's going to be local decisions, local control, because the worst thing that can happen is to leave those vaccines in the freezer because we are afraid to move into that next group and keep going. Uh, we have to have faith in our local public health officials and state health officials to do the right thing and not worry that they're going to I heard a comment about, you know, abuse of the vaccine. Um, clearly, we need to have oversight as best we can, but uh, we've got to um, let the locals do what they think is right in the circumstances so vaccines aren't either wasted by not being used at all or left in the freezer or delaying vaccinations. The, the number one goal needs to get, get that vaccine out there and get folks vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kimberlin. Good morning and good afternoon. David Kimberlin, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics Red Book. Would it be possible to put up slide 10 of Dr. Dooling's presentation? Sure, give us just a minute. Thank you. I have a question and then and then a, a comment. Perfect. Um, you know, we, we've, we've continued to talk throughout these, these last um, couple of hours, I guess, about frontline essential workers. To my understanding, this is the only slide that actually lists them out. And I just want to confirm, this is my question, that the, the when, we, when we talk about frontline essential workers, mm -hmm. it's the bulleted group on the left-hand portion of this slide that we're talking about. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Uh, and, and the same holds true all the way through the vote. When the vote is taken on frontline essential workers, it, you know, assuming it's not modified by the committee, the, the, the left-hand column is the group that we're talking about. That's correct. So, Dr. So, Romero, your call, but this is a really important slide, um, and I, I, I would I would leave it up for as long as possible so we we know exactly what we're what we're talking about. My comment is is you know obviously I'm I'm, I'm representing the American Academy of Pediatrics, and children are not are not part of this for reasons that are, are rather apparent and that we've discussed you know with the Pfizer uh, vote that was taken and so forth. But I do think that we're supporting children by having educators uh, in the frontline essential workers, teachers, daycare uh, staff, support staff, and so forth. And, and, and I commend um, the inclusion of them as frontline essential workers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kimberlin. Dr. Hahn. I'm sorry, I already spoke. I'm gonna take my hand down. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you didn't, I didn't jump over you and you had another comment, forgive me. Uh, Dr. Dries. Thank you, Marcy Dries, representing the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. I just wanted to go back to the comment about remote workers, because um, certainly, you know, within the healthcare workforce, there are a substantial proportion of, of people who do, are, are able to work remotely. 
Um, and they are still essential. You know, a hospital or a clinic can't function without its IT infrastructure working correctly or with the bills being submitted, that sort of thing. Um, but and and the other comment I wanted to make is, you know, what we've been seeing is a lot of our our COVID positive healthcare workforce is not necessarily from direct patient care. It's largely community exposure, which you know anyone uh, is at risk of, regardless of their actual job duties. But then also from healthcare worker to healthcare worker exposures from an asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic uh, healthcare worker, which obviously remote workers would then be somewhat less at risk. Or if they are if they are working remotely, so I mean I really appreciate the the criteria for moving from phase one A to phase one B, but I think if we're if we're the expectation is to get all of these remote healthcare workers in first, you know that would certainly delay uh, deployment to the 75 uh, year old and older patient group as well as the essential workers patient group. And so I think some some additional clarification around, you know, perhaps having a, a dual stream where you're still trying trying to capture some of those remote workers, but you don't hold off before starting a, a for patients um, would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. I just wanted to respond to a couple of the comments. Um, so uh, uh, appreciate uh, Dr. Kimball and asking for this slide to be put up. I think it's incredibly helpful. Um, I just want to recognize that at a national level, ACIP um, will, you know, will make some recommendations about um, prioritization, um, which we hope will translate into allocation, recognizing it might not be perfectly aligned at a, a local and state level. Um, but that these recommendations are going to be imperfect um, in that there are people in, uh, we're trying to, this list on the left uh, provides a gestalt about the industries that we believe to be predominantly frontline. But obviously, as with healthcare workers, and as Dr. Dries just mentioned, there are people in healthcare that um, are able to work remotely. And we specifically have tried to focus in those doses on people who are actually on the front line. I think the same goes for each of these categories. There are probably individuals in each of these groups that are actually able to work remotely. Um, uh, whereas others, the majority will be on the front line um, and conversely on the other side. So I, you know, I, st I struggle a bit with making these uh, recommendations as um, uh, firm and as clear as possible, even though our communication strategy should do that. It is really challenging to implement something like this. So I guess what I wanted to make sure is that um, there's clarity around the recommendations and the intent and going back to Dr. Oliver's slide around the ethics and the questions that are being asked in that um, MMWR article, I would strongly endorse that each industry go back to those recommendations because that those um, questions will get to the intent of what is meant by um, essential workers functionally. Um, the other thing I guess I just want to uh, put out there is that you know, I 100% agree that we cannot leave vaccines sitting on the shelves. Um, and again, I recognize that there are huge implementation challenges with this, uh, nor do I think we should be policing, you know, who actually qualifies and who doesn't. Um, you know, I would hope that we could come together as communities um, and each of these communities individually to be able to articulate who is truly frontline and who is not, and to partner with public health and healthcare delivery systems on that. We are going to have to have some level of trust uh, without uh, being uh, police on this. Uh, but I do also feel strongly that we need to be accountable. So while we cannot leave vaccines sitting on shelves, I, I, I still feel like um, efficiency is incredibly important, but equity is still incredibly important. And so I think we're going to have to find ways, even if they're not easy to do and without um, asking people to be the police, to ensure that we are actually measuring in some way um, the account of the um, equity in terms of the distribution of these vaccines. Because if we can't do that, my worry is that, um, for example, in category 1C, it is going to be very easy for there to be um, insufficient doses to make sure that the intent of the recommendations are followed. And so I do think um, there, I, I don't know again exactly how to do this. I have some ideas about how to do this at a local level. Um, at a national and state level, I'll defer to our colleagues for thinking about how to do that. But I, I, we cannot um, abandon equity because it's hard to measure and it's hard to do. I still feel strongly we're going to have to address it. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lee, this is this is Amanda. Thank you for your comments. I do want to um, let everyone know that uh, 
the CDC is working with local and state health departments, as well as some of these industries to, to help uh, to be able to measure and account for uh, how many of these doses uh, are, are being uh, given to these different groups. Uh, so we do, we'll have some way to measure uh, the effectiveness of, um, of reaching uh, different types of individuals who are uh, prioritized or for vaccination. Um, I do want to also tell ACIP members that we are, while these bulleted points of it, to, to, to reiterate Dr. Lee's comments, these, this is a bulleted list of uh, high-level uh, uh, employment groups that we recommend um, are included in the frontline essential workers, but we're asking ACIP to vote on language that says frontline essential workers. So this is not black and white. And there will absolutely be, and it will vary by local context, uh, some individuals who, some, some even some employment groups that uh, some localities may consider frontline workers that other, um, that, that wouldn't make sense for other localities based on, for example, you know, urban and rural uh, and different types of communities. So. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Um, a, a word to those listening. Um, in an effort to uh, allow everyone to at least have um, one opportunity to speak, and we have plenty of time, I, I want to say that, um, I'm going to be skipping around to those individuals that have not um, had an opportunity to comment, um, so I will get back to everybody and I will work the, uh, the voting members in there also. So let me go to um, Dr. Stinchfield. Thank you. Uh, this is Patsy Stinchfield representing uh, NAPNAP. First of all, sincere gratitude to all the work group members who had tripled the meetings that all of us uh, at ACIP did. I just cannot thank you enough for this great work. I agree with your recommendations. I especially have appreciated the paradigm of science, ethics, and, and practical implication or implementation. I wanted to speak, however, and give voice from a, a, a person uh, from hospitals and clinics for a moment to someone who's responsible to implement uh, and vaccinate uh, children's hospitals and clinics in Minnesota, large healthcare system here. Our vaccine is due tomorrow. Uh, so let's just say I'm multitasking a bit today. Um, but that image we see of that shot in the arm is in fact just a joyful figurative shot in the arm. Uh, but really belies the work behind it. Hospitals and clinics are both elated and exhausted. Uh, the enormous heavy lift of operationalizing vaccination in healthcare is not easy. Even though we do vaccinations, this is not easy. Uh, extensive resources for an overstressed, understaffed healthcare system uh, is needed. I would say we too are on life support. Uh, every hospital in the United States has really greatly appreciated the standard tools that CDC has provided, the standing orders, the screening tools, the education. That is exactly what we need, so not every hospital is trying to do the same thing and figure out the same process, um, saving resources and getting more around standard work. But Category 1B folks will really need significant help and, and will benefit from more tools. For example, the things we didn't have, um, tools on how to think through prioritization, even some mathematical considerations, such as waiting at the local level, scheduling tools, um, and also a state dashboard. So people know where are we in this process, in this journey, when will we be coming up? Now, I don't think every state or every local uh, level needs to figure out a dashboard. Why don't we share our resources, pool them together in a centralized place where we can learn from each other? Um, and these scheduling, for example, seems straightforward. Dose one, dose two, 21 days later. But when you go to implement that with rolling clinics and all these different cohorts, it is very complicated. Um, and so it, this daunting task, I think, um, should not be uh, understated. So I just would like to, again, uh, uh, say that hospitals uh, do need resources. They're short staffed. People are out sick with COVID. They're, they're out on quarantine. And those are the, some of the same nurses who are going to be doing vaccination. And then as we look forward to uh, 1B, that logistical implementation tools and materials in multiple languages to help those who are implementing Category 1B will be very important priorities. And again, thanks so much to everyone working on this. 
Thank you. Dr. Grog, please. Yes, this is Stan Grog with the American Osteopathic Association. And I, too, of course, would like to thank everybody involved with the um, vaccines. And this is a monumental uh, task, but uh, something that will be in our future. Anyways, just a couple practical questions. How does a healthcare provider uh, get uh, the vaccines for their offices? Uh, do they apply to somebody? And the second part of the question is, how do the individuals that are in the different phases get notified from the state? Uh, how, do, how do they know how to find them? Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Go down at Whitley Williams, please. Let me take. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Romero. I, uh, I wanted to refer to um, Y19 um, of Dr. Dooling's presentation, um, which uh, looks at the adjusted um, uh, rates. And, uh, you know, again, the I want to make certain that the um, um, equity of access to particularly people of color um, from communities of color are um, is is supported as much as possible. I know we support it in words. Um, I'm very uh, was happy to hear Dr. Cohen just say there is going to be some monitoring as we um, go through um, administering vaccinations, I guess on a national basis or is that something the states will do because i think that would be important to um, assess um and again i don't you know can can it be done on a weekly basis in terms of which groups um are actually being vaccinated and and are we truly um reaching those who are um at highest uh risk and again i'd like to thank the um, the, uh, you know, the work group and Dr. Uh, Bell and uh, Dooling and Oliver and, and the rest of the CDC staff. This has just been a phenomenal amount of work. And I, when I speak to the um, community persons, I do try to emphasize that we have some of the most caring people um, um, who are working on this. So, um, as we move forward, I understand the task is daunting, but I think it's, uh, it would be very helpful to be able to relay um, to the community that yes, equity is being looked at, at in real time um, as uh, vaccine doses are administered. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Thank you. So um, let me make my comments here um, because uh, Dr. Grog and, and Dr. Whitley uh, Williams have, have provided a segue. So, uh, you know, we've spent um, excellent uh, comments on allocation, um, uh, distribution, administration, but again, it is, we need to also have an educational uh, component of this to those groups that are frontline uh, essential workers, to these groups that are being uh, prioritized in 1C and 1C um, categories. Um, I, I'm learning more and more as I begin to offer um, education to the uh, agricultural workers um, of, of the United States that one size does not fit all. And, and we are going to have to develop methods um, that transmit uh, to them uh, their need for the vaccination, how to get the vaccination and provide that and reach into those communities um, with uh, culturally and linguistically appropriate educational measures. Uh, and, and, and mean. So uh, again, that I think is the, is the one piece that we really cannot forget about as we move forward. So let me go on to um, the next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Freihofer. Uh, Sandra Freihofer representing the uh, American Medical Association uh, and speaking uh, as a practicing physician. And I wanna echo the comments of Dr. Grog and of Dr. Goldman earlier, um, where, how do healthcare professionals uh, get vaccine for their offices? I think uh, physicians uh, that are uh, employed by the hospital, you know, they're being taken care of, but I cannot tell you the number of emails that I personally have received 
um, from physicians wanting to know where to go. I received one um, email from a, a, a physician who is the director of a Good Samaritan clinic, and she was trying to figure out how she could get vaccine for herself and for her staff. And this is a, a, a practice that um, takes care of the, um, of you know, people that don't have any ways of, of getting medical care in any other way. I mean, just the, the, uh, the most vulnerable. Um, I've gotten emails from physicians that are doing locums. Um, so I, I was just struck when Dr. Grog asked that question that unlike these other questions that have been asked, there was silence. And I, I realized that this is really not what ACIP can do but I think ACIP can raise um, awareness that this is a problem and that hospitals need to reach out past their walls to the community and make sure these frontline healthcare providers have access to vaccine so they can continue to take care of their patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So, um uh, these comments are, are very good and they are on point, but um, in order to get through all these speakers and, and questions, please focus your comments um, on the topics at hand today and, and not so much um, uh, on issues of, of, of implementation, um, but comments per se. Thank you very much. Um, let me turn to uh, Dr. McKinney. Thank you. It's Dr. Paul McKinney from the Association for Prevention, Teaching and Research. I wonder if Dr. Dooling or Oliver could comment on the risk for hospitalization or death among persons 65 to 74 years of age who have one or more comorbid conditions versus those 75 and over all comers since they're presented as being in different priority groups, uh, 1B and 1C. This is Dr. Oliver. I don't have those numbers right off the top of my head, but we'll see if we can uh, get some information and share with you. Thank you. Dr. Shaw, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Romero. This is uh, Nero Shaw, the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control uh, on behalf of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers. Um, first, a, a question uh, and then a comment, but before all that, thank you all for the, especially the team at the US CDC uh, for preparing these materials and for the clarity of thought. This has been a very helpful discussion. Uh, first is the question, uh, on the slide that is in front of us, as we were doing our initial planning and pre preparation uh, in our state, we had thought that food service, which currently appears on the column on the right, would in fact be uh, on, in, in the frontline column on the left, recognize that that discretion lies with the states, but I would be curious as to the rationale for inclusion of food service on the other category. By my reckoning, they are certainly essential but also on the front line. So curious as to the rationale. Uh, second, as an observation, uh, we are approaching phase 1B uh, with three buckets in mind. Uh, the first bucket has been discussed extensively today, which is the identification bucket. But recognizing at the state level, there will be further nuances that will have to be drawn. Uh, for example, which manufacturing, so on and so forth. Uh, grocery store workers, we agree, but does that also include retail? but that has a grocery store component, so on and so forth. So that's identification. There is a second question, which our, my colleague from the Osteopathic Association noted, which is notification. How do we let folks know that their, their time in line is, is ready? That will be a significant challenge. And then the final one is vaccination, getting to some of the implementation questions that have been raised. Recognize that's also not the focus, but just wanted to offer that as our framework of how we're thinking about this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Romero. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. So now I'm going to return to the top of the list. Dr. Zahn, thank you for waiting so patiently. Go ahead. Oh, great. Th thank you, Dr. Romero. Uh, just a, a comment on uh, vaccination of residents of homeless shelters and uh, inmates and detainees at uh, correctional facilities. I very much appreciate that they were included in this conversation of 1B and 1C. But I, I think the, the uh, and I can't remember exactly how it was phrased on the slide, but there's some conversation about, or it was described as, depending on local epidemiology and situation. And that, you know, I would just say for uh, vaccinating uh, persons experiencing homelessness in shelter situations, their social situation, their economic, physical situation, 
along with their, you know, often difficult relationship with government, just distrust of government. You know, anybody who's uh, uh, reached out to, the, to this population before could tell you that it is, and I think you all know, it is a uh, resource-intensive, long-term process to get uh, that population vaccinated. And so, I, it, you know, to my mind, I think, boy, if I want to vaccinate that population here locally, we have to start doing it sooner rather than later. There really isn't an epidemiologic reason or a local reason that would make me change. I can decide, I, you know, we just have to start working at it if we're going to get that population adequately protected. So, uh, so those are my comments. Thank you. D Dr. Romero, this is Dr. Messonnier. May uh, I just make a clarifying comment? Yes, I was going to call on you. I'm sorry. I had problems getting off of you. Please go forward. Yeah, so um, I just want to thank the ACIP members and the li liaisons for these really helpful comments. Um, we will um, really try in the clinical considerations document that Dr. Oliver described to be more um, specific about the thinking of the work group about why certain groups fell in certain categories and what it's meant to convey with the hopes that at least being able to articulate the rationale may help those on the front lines who um, are the ones that are actually going to be faced with making a list and deciding who actually gets in front and who gets in back. And I think, um, for example, on, on that recent comment about, um, about um, outbreaks in homeless shelters, there is language in here that reflects the working group's consideration that there have clearly been several large outbreaks in those populations and that that may lead some jurisdictions to um, prioritize those groups over others. I, I think I would say broadly that um, these comments are especially helpful because it points out to us places where we really need to be clearer about the rationale. I do think that the CDC staff and the working group um, have tried to walk a careful line in um, providing a um, an approach to this with the thinking behind it, but also not trying to over-engineer it because, as Dr. Han said, you know, we recognize that in the... Um, in the end, it will be those at the front lines of the jurisdictions that that actually have to kind of make the translate this into um, uh, implementable guidance. Um, I, I think they've tried to strike the correct balance, but we will definitely be listening carefully for places where additional clarity or additional precision would be helpful to those who are going to be faced with making these tough choices. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Messonnier. Uh, Dr. Salaji, please. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, hi. Um, I, I just want to, I, I know there's a tremendous amount of angst in who exactly goes into phase 1B versus 1C, and I really understand and have had a lot of angst myself. I, I just want to make the point that um, we're, 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 we're assuming that all, in, or we're not assuming, but we're hoping all individuals who are in these groups will accept the vaccine, but we actually have a lot of data from a number of surveys that suggest that while a lot of individuals want the vaccine, many want to wait and see. So my point is that we are likely to pass through phase 1B very quickly, even if everybody does it the way they really want to and the way, uh, and, and even if uh, we provide, which we are, substantial amount of flexibility to localities, which I think we should do. So honestly, one of my biggest concerns has to do with the need to um, provide a significant amount of effort, resources, outreach to enable vaccine confidence. And this is especially among communities of color. Uh, we also have data that essential workers, that the desire for the vaccine currently is not very different from other workers. So I feel we're going to pass through phase 1B extremely quickly within potentially weeks or a month and start into phase 1C. And we really have to focus our efforts very strongly on uh, ensuring vaccine confidence. Uh, and a lot of this is going to come at the local level. So I just want to reinforce those uh, points about needing the resources to be able to outreach to high-risk communities 
as well as to those uh, who, who have underlying medical conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dushan. Thank you, Dr. Romero. This is a point of clarification. Can um, someone specify where our nation's public health workers who do things like surveillance, disease, uh, COVID outbreak investigation response, uh, planning for these vaccination programs, where do they fall on the prioritization? I'm not talking about our clinical staff who have patient contacts, but the ones who do the other activities that I specified. Thank you. Hello, this is Dr. Dueling. Uh, so public health staff who have direct patient contact would be considered healthcare personnel under the current definition. And uh, public health are considered uh, essential workers under the CISA definition. And uh, those persons would fall under phase 1C. It would be nice to add them to, to the list if possible. Thank you. Let me, let me second Dr. Uh, uh, Dushin's uh, comment. Um, I, I, I agree with that. Um, Dr. Paling. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, I wanted to go back to a comment that Dr. Bernstein uh, said a while ago, because if I understood correctly, we're going to have enough doses um, to vaccinate 30 million people in January and 50 million people in February. And so I believe what he did was he said, if um, 75 and older is um, in the frontline essential workers is almost 50,000 and there's about 30,000, 65 and 74, could one B be 65 and older as well as frontline essential workers? And uh, I'll just want to get your thoughts on that. This is Dr. Cohn. Um, it would be great to hear from um, Dr. Uh, Bell or anyone else on the ACIP work group, but I think one of the implementation considerations about sticking with the 75 plus as opposed to increasing is um, is to allow for more targeted and focused vaccination um, uh, especially, you know, remember that these doses are not all available at the beginning of the month. It, they're coming in. And so to allow for focused um, targeting of a smaller total size group uh, so that both the frontline essential workers and the 75 plus, um, it, it, it would dilute things out a little bit if added the 20, however many more. I think it's um, the 32 million for 65 to 74 year olds. Um, but it'd be great to hear from some of the other um, ACIP members who have been in the work group discussions. This is Dr. Bell. Um, I think that the, the point that's being raised is a um, very legitimate one and reflects, you know, um, a lot of con concern about balancing um, on demand and supply and all that, all those considerations. Um, I, I think that... Um, you know, there are a couple of issues here. Um, first of all, what Dr. Cohn just raised about, um, you know, having the opportunity to focus on a, not an enormous group um, immediately. Um, second is I think that while we greatly appreciate these supply projections that um, I guess HHS has provided, um, they are only supply projections. And um, while I would love to believe that they're, in fact, the way things are going to go, we really don't know that. Um, and so I think um, we certainly don't want to have a supply outstripping demand, as Dr. Hahn mentioned. We also don't want to have the Congress. So that, I think, is why we've uh, sort of ended up with this kind of balance for the moment. Um, however, I, I do believe, agree that um, if, in fact, we blow through these um, two phases as we potentially could, Hopefully we won't because we will have um, more demand than uh, we have. We will have a lot of demand. Then I think the issue of um, being clear about some suggestions about how to prioritize in phase 1C, at least from the ACIP's perspective, uh, will be something um, that we will need to get ahead of relatively quickly. And so I think this is something my preference, I think, is that we um, wait and see um, for another period of, you know, three weeks or something like that. And if it looks like um, we are, in fact, reaching phase 1C, that then we provide some additional 
uh, guidance for people in terms of uh, how to approach um, that large group of people in phase 1C. On the other hand, I think if uh, the ACIP feels strongly that we should, in fact, add, you know, go down in the age um, recommendations for our current recommendations, um, you know, we certainly can um, take that up. So this is Jose. So um, as we thought about, or as I thought about, um, prioritization of, of that over 65 year group, um, it was the volume uh, of, uh, of individuals in that, the number of, of, of individuals in that group that um, was most concerned to me is, and, the, and, and the supply of a vaccine. And so um, coming to this recommendation that, that we have now, I think um, identifies that highest risk group um, within that age group um, and uh, addresses what we have for what we believe is vaccine available at this time. And I think Dr. Bell has, has pointed that out, that if, if it turns out that we have um, more vaccine, if, if, you know, if these projections are, uh, go forward and we have more vaccine, we can certainly open this up. But um, including them in my mind, including that entire group, um, would prolong that phase um, significantly um, as we wait for more vaccine to come out. So um, overall, I think that given these two populations, that is the essential workers and those individuals over 65, um, this is the best way of melding the two groups together and uh, uh, giving um, uh, an equitable and appropriate distribution of the vaccine um, to this group. Over. Anyone else? Yeah, Dr. Dr. Romero, this is uh, Grace Lee. I just wanted to um, uh, and, and endorse uh, what you both said. I, you know, I feel comfortable that the work group has had a chance to uh, deliberate thoroughly and review the data at hand. Uh, for the current phase 1B recommendation. I um, personally don't feel comfortable uh, expanding on the fly <laughs> as we go, just because I feel like we, we need to actually look at all of the data in totality and make sure that the, if we need to expand, I would advocate for a, another emergency meeting uh, rather than trying to do this on the fly today. Thank you. Dr. Lee, I would also like to uh, say that we can absolutely uh, be very clear in the clinical considerations about gating criteria and, and make those uh, quite specific to age gating. You know, Jose, this Pablo, um, please, can I comment on that? Yes, please do, Dr. Sanchez. Hi. Um, so I'm really glad that we were able to go through the, you know, or anticipate that we'll be able to go through the phases quickly. But I, I do remain concerned about the 65 to 74 and those with underlying medical conditions um, because I think that that those can be prioritized as well. I, I mentioned before the, the exposure risk, and I think those who are retired, for instance, uh, should not should not fall into phase 1B. But those who are some of these some of these individuals in phase 1C who are older or who have high risk medical conditions and real, and are still working and are not working remotely and are still quite um, important, you know, performing something important to society. I think I would want to see them moved up than one of the frontline workers who are young and are unlikely to have a more severe disease. So I, I, I really, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with um, relegating them to one scene. Um, I think we really need to think about what the exposure is um, and and what and try to sub prioritize some of those as well and try to move some of those up because um, some high risk medical conditions who who are not working remotely and are saying I mean I just I feel uncomfortable um, that they shouldn't be prioritized. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments uh, on, on, on these topics that we just discussed? Yes, this is Kip. Um, Please, Dr. Talbot. I think we referred to the long-term effects of COVID, but we're not very specific. Um, and I think we should probably clarify what we mean by that for everyone who's listening. We are having young adults survive hospitalization who have had strokes, who now have heart failure, who had multiple amputations, 
Um, and we, as of now, do not have data on this. Um, and so I think when we talk about young adults survive the hospitalization, we have to remember many may survive, but may not have life as before. And so I, I think we need to be very cautious about saying young adults will be fine. Um, I have spent the past week on backup clinical call and have read these charts and have cried every day. So I think we have to be very cautious about saying that they don't die um, and remember that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? On oh, this Jose, this is Peter, could I comment on the over 65? If, yes, in the, yes, please do. Um, I, 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 this is a really tough one and I've agonized over this one as well. I'm not on the COVID work group and I, I hear what Dr. Sanchez is saying. I actually think that um, I'd be concerned about making that decision today. Um, and I, I would suggest uh, putting this into a sub-prioritization decision within one C because it may end up being a combination of, as Dr. Sanchez says, of being between 65 and 75 um, and having one or more or multiple chronic conditions. Um, and also, some of the individuals over 65 are already frontline workers, so they're already going to be there, or healthcare personnel, so they're already going to be there. And so, my my suggestion would be to um, do this in, in a future meeting, or to try to get future additional data to look at exactly who is high risk, because it would add another potentially 20 million minus the overlap, so maybe 17 or 18 million of over 65 year olds. Ms. Paul Hunter, I'd like to comment. Let me, let me just add something to that, and then Paul, you you can go. But Thanks. remember, the implementation of this, um, if you sub prioritize, um, puts a significant burden on healthcare and on public health to identify individuals that have these these comorbid conditions, uh, as was said, and, and and it may exacerbate the dis the disparities uh, that we have because um, men, some individuals in this age group. Um, or don't have access to medical care and cannot come up with a doctor's note that will say, I have diabetes, I have hypertension. So I, I just want to throw that out there as a comment since we're discussing this at this time. Uh, please, Dr. Hunter, I didn't mean to cut you off. No problem. Um, Paul Hunter, uh, voting member from Wisconsin. Uh, the, I'd like to support the current um, uh, policy uh, suggestion that we're going to, uh, was proposed that we vote on. Um, and leaving things the way they are with the 75 and older and the uh, narrowed essential worker, um, frontline essential workers. I, I hear what uh, Peter is saying about going through these um, uh, groups quickly, and I don't think that's necessarily a problem because I think it'll address what other people's concerns are is that we'll get to the younger folks faster. Um, so. Uh, the only, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments on this topic? Dr. Dr. Romero, Romero, I just, oh, Dr. Romero, this is Dr. Cohn. I just, um, one of the, just to provide, first of all, thank you, all of the ACIP members for uh, the incredible uh, thought you guys have put into this challenging question. And we, we definitely want to hear more comments. One thing to just, um, explain from an implementation perspective for everyone to think about is the the way that we have thought about uh, vaccinating persons with underlying illnesses, one of the best ways to do that, and frankly, adults, six, you know, younger, ad, older, younger, older adults, is to uh, get vaccine in providers' offices and in pharmacies. And we, at some, in the near future, we will have that capacity to get vaccine more broadly distributed to many, many more administration sites than what we have now, which is still relatively focused uh, administration sites. They, we will increase the number of administration sites with the Moderna uh, vaccine being recommended and authorized this week. Um, so I also from an implementation perspective, it is um, easier to implement identifying persons who have underlying health conditions when we have more vaccine to spread further. Um, but I, I really, I, I think that the the uh, one of the things that we're hearing is that some additional guidance around subprioritization within 1C, um, which may prioritize, for example, age or underlying medical conditions over 
uh, some of the more healthy frontline, uh, non-frontline essential workers uh, may sort of ensure that this group is sort of, that, that those groups are right behind um, the current groups that are in the one phase, phase 1B group. And we can certainly do that. We can recommend those groups in 1C today and then come back with some more um, specific either clinical considerations or recommendations for subprioritization of 1C. And this is Dr. Bell. Uh, just to echo what Dr. Kahn said, this is actually has been a topic of discussion within the work group already. Uh, and I think um, many of us are, you know, thinking about that as kind of a next step. This is Pablo. Um, I would agree with what um, with what Dr. Cohn has said as well. This is Sharon. I um, agree with moving forward with the question as it stands, the vote as it stands. I think that we'll move through these um, groups very quickly, and we can only do so much at one time. And I like. Um, I agree with everything everybody's saying, their concerns, but we can only move so quickly and we only have a limited number of vaccines. We'll get more vaccines. They are forthcoming uh, and we will move very quickly down the age, de-escalate down the age scale uh, and include those comor groups with comorbidities, I think, relatively quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments on this? Yes, Dr. Romero, this, oh. this is Robert Atmar. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to uh, lend my voice to the, the last few comments. Um, I, when we went through the presentation initially, I wondered about the, the threshold at 75 versus 65, but I'm pers persuaded by um, the overall presentation, Dr. Bell's comments about the uncertainty of um, of the projected supply and the likelihood that in a matter of uh, as, as few as two to three weeks, um, we could move from 1B into to 1C so that the delay will not be that much uh, uh, greater, hopefully, before um, we're able to uh, vaccinate um, persons over 65. I, I it sounds like from Dr. Bell's comments that the work group has already uh, considered this, but uh, I would ask her and the other work group members to take the concerns raised here back to the work group. And if they feel there's uh, a need for additional um, uh, guidance uh, to, to bring it back to Dr. Cohn and CDC administration, for consideration of an additional ACIP meeting, but Dr. Cohn's proposal of um, sub prioritizing 1C is acceptable to me. Thank you. Thank you. Last call for comments on this before I turn to the list. There are still hands up. Yeah, uh, this is uh, Hank Bernstein. So I, I for me, I. Um, I hear and, and honestly, when we're talking about in weeks, I. I, for me, skeptically, we've uh, delivered uh, 2.9 million doses of Pfizer's, but have only uh, gotten about 300,000 into arms, as I understand it. And the reason I brought up about those 65 to 74 is because I kind of feel that the when you look at the numbers, the science, the risk of in-hospital death, the mortality rates, the incidence of COVID-19, and the hospitalizations with underlying medical conditions. All of those slides that were presented, they're awfully, they're awfully similar between the um, 65 to 74 uh, with the 75 and above. Of course, if uh, it, it sounds like the discussion that this is going to be evolve rather rapidly and is going to move into um, be able to involve them or offer it to them rather uh, quickly, um, I can understand that, but I, I kind of feel the science suggested moving them into 1B. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I'm turning back to the list. Uh, Dr. Shaw? Dr. Romero, my apologies, I forgot to lower my hand. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sanchez, any other comments? 
No, no, sorry. I'm going to, I lower my hand. Thank you. I just want actually, to Dr. Romero, if, if I may, I, I, I failed. I wouldn't mind actually making one observation and, and request. Um, this is again, uh, Neerup Shaw from the state of Maine on behalf of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers. Uh, while, I, while I appreciate the flexibility afforded to states with respect to vaccination of individuals living in congregate settings, whether those be carceral settings or otherwise, uh, at the same time, having clear guidance to ensure uniformity across the country would also help achieve the goals of equity uh, to ensure that some states are not making decisions that prioritize or deprioritize those individuals and thus creating a patchwork system. So I would, I would urge and recommend uh, the ACIP members as well as the staff who are working on these issues at CDC to um, recognizing the flexibility to make recommendations as to where such individuals should be placed. Thank you very much. Dr. Lee, do you have another comment? I do, sorry. <laughs> um, I wanted to just, you know, so like I feel very comfortable with 1B where it is. And, I, you know, I think moving forward with that uh, particular decision uh, needs to happen uh, in order to help our states and jurisdictions with planning. I, I actually, um, you know, we, we heard um, some of the challenges with phase 1C. I also just wanted to add another um, sort of nuance, which is that, I um, fully endorse the list of high risk conditions based on the evidence to date uh, that, uh, you know, is coming through on the ACIP website uh, around high risk conditions. I do think that, um, you know, it, uh, the CDC has been incredible, sorry, the CDC website, not the ACIP website, the CDC website. I do think that the um, CDC also has been updating that in real time, which I really appreciate because every time I go back to the website, I can um, usually find new information. Um, so I think that will be a source uh, of important um, uh, you know, guidance regarding prioritization for high-risk medical conditions. But I do have to actually mention that that only focuses on prevalent high-risk medical conditions. So there are many um, low, um, uh, rare, or less common medical conditions that put individuals at high risk that don't come through in the data that we're seeing nationally. Um, and I don't know where to put those individuals. I, I can think of, for example, um, you know, individuals with neuromuscular condition whose respiratory condition is impaired may not be on the list because they um, don't have sufficient numbers to demonstrate evidence of um, uh, negative effect. And so I just, I think we need to think through 1C a little bit more carefully exactly what goes in there. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Dr. Thanks. Cohn, I see you on the hand. Um, shall we move on to, um, to uh, putting uh, the uh, language up for review. Yes, that would be great. We are moving um, back towards that slide. I do just want to say um, while we're pulling that slide up that um, we will um, absolutely uh, revise the cl clinical considerations document uh, based on the input um, both the voting members and liaison members have given us today. Um, uh, and uh, we appreciate all of that input, but we will certainly make sure that it allows, it, it balances that specificity as well as flexibility um, from both a medical condition perspective as well as congregate living setting and these those other considerations. And here's the language. Do you wanna read Thank it? you. Who, should I read it or do you have one of the uh, co-chairs read it? I, I can read it, Dr. Romero. This is Dr. Dueling. The proposed interim recommendation is as an update to ACIP recommendations for vaccination in phase 1A, healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents. If COVID-19 vaccine supply is limited, the following groups should be offered vaccination. Phase 1B, persons aged 75 years and older and frontline essential workers and phase 1C, persons aged 65 to 74 years old, persons aged 16 to 64 years with high-risk medical conditions and other essential workers. Thank you, Dr. Julie. So um, do I have a motion and a second to accept this interim recommendation? Dr. Solaji, your hand just went up. Yes, I, I move to accept this recommendation as written. Dr. Fry, your hand went up. I move to second the motion. 
Thank you very much. So we have a, a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Dr. Lee, I see that you have your hand up. Um, I'm gonna apologize and ask for a, a process question, which is that I, um, I feel uh, very comfortable moving forward with the interim recommendation for phase 1B. I do feel that phase 1C needs further discussion and so uh, would recommend splitting the vote. But I don't know how to do that procedurally, apologies. Is it an amendment or may I call an amendment now? <laughs> So, so you're calling for, so you're calling for recommendations to accept the wording as it stands for and through phase 1B, but not to vote on phase 1C. Am I correct? Y yes, because, and um, let me just explain my rationale to make sure that process-wise this makes sense. Um, I feel like uh, we heard concerns today that there were um, perhaps additional uh, considerations that should be uh, brought forward in further discussion regarding um, if sufficient doses are not available for the entirety of phase 1C, how to think about prioritization. Um, I also just want to make sure, because we did not review the risk of high-risk medical conditions today, I don't feel comfortable um, without uh, clarification on what that list entails um, uh, moving forward with a, a vote on that. So my, that, that's my uh, concern, but I'll defer to Dr. Cohn and um, you, Dr. Romero, about that process. Actually, this is um, Dr. Um, could, could I just say something? Uh, ahead, sorry, yeah. this is Dr. Bell. Go ahead, Dr. Bell. Oh, um, oh, is that you? Who is that, Nancy? You want to say something? Or you go I'm first, and then I'll go second. Can, can okay. I, point of order. Oh, go ahead, Jose. Jose, go ahead. Please announce yourselves when you speak so that we may know who is speaking. Whoever is speaking, go forth. Dr. Bell, is that you? Uh, I sounds like yes. This is Dr. Okay, Bell, and I wanted to um, respond to Dr. Lee's um, points by saying the following: um, If uh, we all obviously recall that um, there is, um, there, as far as I am know, and Dr. Cohn can certainly um, correct me, uh, there is no, uh, there is nothing that precludes the ACIP from further clarification in the form of either a vote or clinical consideration um, to further uh, clarify uh, phase 1C, even if we have it the way it is currently proposed at this time. So we are not locked into anything by, by having 1C characterized right now. I agree with Dr. Lee. We do have actually a definition for the underlying conditions right now. It's the CDC list. I agree with Dr. Lee that this is actually something that we need to pay some attention and think through in the work group because it may not be most appropriate for this uh, situation. My concern about having a vote right now, which, which stops at phase 1B, is that it means that um, all of our discussions about gating and uh, having some flexibility of moving from one phase to the other is dependent upon the work group and the ACIP coming back in what could be a very short period of time with um, an additional need, additional vote on phase 1C. And while I'm fully committed to doing that, um, I think that um, I do not see a downside to having some general consideration, some general statements about phase 1C available uh, to states and localities now with the understanding that it will not be the final word of the ACIP on this process. As I say, I'm concerned about having nothing on the table for the general direction of phase 1C, um, which could be clarified by clinical considerations um, uh, at this time. And so that's why I, I, I really don't think that by voting um, the, on the current wording, I don't think that we are endorsing um, all of the details of phase 1C, nor are we suggesting that this is going to be our final word on that topic. Thank you. Dr. Messonnier, did I hear your voice? Yes. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Bell. And I guess I, I would just reiterate and expand on what you said. I am, I, I am quite concerned um, at the idea of putting off a vote on um, getting beyond 1B. You know, as several of you have said, 
we actually really don't know how quickly we will make it through 1B to 1C. And frankly, also, our jurisdictions are trying to plan out the next month or two of their work. Getting to some of these populations is quite difficult and requires a lot of um, on-ground logistics and planning. And we are really hoping that by getting through um, <laughs> uh, uh, getting through 1B and 1C, we, we can help them get forward on that process. As I think you all have heard from several of the state and local health department leads that have spoken, the folks on the ground are already basically working their way through these different phases. And so I would be concerned about putting off another vote, especially since truthfully that would mean putting it off until after the holidays. But you have my commitment, as Dr. Bell said, that, that we will use the clinical consideration um, uh, language as we did in healthcare workers to provide the additional sub-prioritization as we've heard today from the ACIP members and as um, given input from the liaisons. I think we've clearly heard the need to sub-prioritize in 1B based on age groups, and we understand the need to be more clear about the high-risk medical conditions and, and all of those things the team will be rapidly incorporating into the clinical considerations. But our desire from CDC is for you, if possible, to at least get through both of these um, phases, even if the language, yeah, both of these phases, because we, we really feel like we and the jurisdictions are hampered um, by the need to, to be able to really do some more advanced planning. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Messonnier. So as a, as a point of explanation, we now have two motions on the table. Uh, one that has been uh, 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 seconded, the other one by Dr. Lee. Is, are there any more comments as to these two co as to these motions right now? Because we either have to vote on this first motion and then address Dr. Lee's motion, or Dr. Lee has to withdraw her motion, and then we can move forward. May I come? Oh, go ahead. Oh, this is uh, uh, Pablo. Um, as someone who brought up my, the concern with the phase 1C and the elderly um, and the high-risk medical conditions, um, I, I, and I'm, my concern is still there, but I am very much um, satisfied with the comments from Dr. Messonnier and also from Dr. Cohn. Um, and I really do see the need to move forward with this, with both phase 1B and 1C recommendation, because I do think we have to start, we have to provide guidance to all the jurisdictions because it's, it's I mean, this is rapidly evolving and we want to be able to, to rev up all of the vaccination uh, programs so I am actually in agreement with moving forward as stated with the phase 1B and 1C with the recognition that um, that further sub-prioritization uh, will be coming forth very soon. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Phelan, your hand is up. Is it in reference to these two motions? Yes, it is. Please go forward. Oh, okay. So um, I wanted to um, also thank Drs. Messonnier, Cohn, and Bell for their clarifications. I want to support the um, recommendation as it is worded, and um, and um, I recognize the importance. And actually, for hours, we've been talking about the importance of um, empowering public health in our communities to prepare. And we've also talked about the importance of educating, so we do need to specify. I would ask the work group, when they're working through the high-risk medical conditions, to consider if the influenza high-risk medical conditions is um, achieves the goal in trying to make it so it's easier to implement. Um, that's the end of my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Atmar, your hand just popped up. Yes, Dr. Romero, thank you. I want to call a point of order. Uh, I, I believe we had a, a motion on the, the floor that was seconded, and then we had Dr. Lee uh, uh, put a motion to amend um, the original motion. And before we discuss it further, there should be a second to hers, or it should 
otherwise just die. Uh, you are you are correct, Dr. Atmar, in 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 that point of order. Um, so uh, yes, in the fray that was lost by your um, by your chair. So um, I will need. Dr. Romero, can before you go forward, this is uh, uh, Grace Lee. May I just make a comment? Please go ahead. Um, well, actually, I'm going to uh, make the point to withdraw the motion, um, uh, but with the request of the following is, is that I still think there needs to be more public um, discussion um, and transparency around the clinical considerations and the guidance that's given. I am actually totally fine with the vote as is with regard to supporting, again, our states and jurisdictions with planning. Um, and I do feel that this is going to be, uh, you know, the phase 1B and 1C uh, discussion we're having is um, absolutely on target. I uh, am more concerned, I'm not concerned at all with phase 1B. I just want, I would like to request more open and transparent discussion around phase 1C uh, because I don't feel like we've fully um, and thoroughly uh, gotten all of the considerations and the rationale out into the open. And so having the ability to do that, I think would address my concern. Thank you. Dr. Lee so, uh, or Dr. Romero. Um, I'd like to uh, make a process recommendation that we do have a second of the motion and Dr. Lee withdrew the, um, the, the proposal to amend the motion. So we do have a vote on the table to vote on. What I'd like to recommend is that we take a break, move to public comment, and then when we come back from public comment, I'd like for us to return to this question of the high-risk medical conditions, and we will put up a couple of slides um, with some proposed clinical considerations, and we'll show uh, everyone the flu high-risk conditions list, which um, uh, I I agree is a very uh, is a list that would be consistent with. Um, with additional uh, uh, high-risk conditions that are not on the COVID high list, uh, high-risk conditions list, and we'll put those together and see and get some feedback from the ACIP members before we vote. Very good. Yes, very good. So um, we will take a break. And do you want that break to be uh, fifteen or twenty minutes? Um, your choice. You're the chair. <laughs> I just wanted to see how, how strict we wanted to stay on schedule. Um, let's, let's make it 20 minutes. Yes. So we, we will meet um, at approximately. Uh, we can start uh, the public comment session at 2.05. Does that work? Very good. <laughs> Great. Very good. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. We'll return at 2.05. 